If everyone could take their seats, uh, and while they are, I'm going to, uh, before we start the clock, I just, uh, as many of you know, I'm going to, I'm going to exert a little chairman's prerogative here because uh, Mr. Wheeler and I have not always gotten along. And I'll, I'll have my opening statement here, but I'm just sick and tired of sort of your third string approach to winning and the way you're willing to uh, tackle and run over the top of people and score points just for scoring points. Now, now that the U of O O U game is over in the uh, National Football Championship, I want everybody to know I have kept my promise mm -hmm. and worn the Ohio State tie. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I no, you're out of order. I I'm hope just going to no. say that right now. Mute the mics. I'd be nothing. I hope we are on the record because I just want to say two things. Number one, you're an honorable man. You Thank know, you. You you had the wrong side, and we were pleased to beat you with our backup to the backup quarterback. <laughs> um, you think but, this is going to go better for you? But I, <laughs> but I do think that the color is very becoming on you. Now, just so you know, I have now filled my, my bet that I would wear the Ohio State tie if, if they beat my Ducks and vice versa. I also want you to know there's a pending matter to be settled. I did offer updates for lunch, which I will buy. And I suggested February 26th might have been a wonderful day for the chairman to have lunch with me. He suggested he had other matters to attend to. All right, enough of fun and frivolity. Um, thank you all for being here, and I thank our FCC commissioners for being here and my colleagues. Uh, I know this is a quote-unquote go-away day, and we'll probably get interrupted by votes, so we'll try and move through this. But this is really important business we're going to take up, as we always do in this committee, and so uh, on to the serious matters. You know, it was just over uh, two weeks ago that we had the commission's managing director present us with his rationale for the largest budget uh, request in history for the Federal Communications Commission. We were able to discuss with him whether the funding levels requested would actually yield an effective and credible agency. Today we have the opportunity to ask the commissioners themselves whether this agency is functioning as it should, whether it's producing the high caliber policy making that American society requires and deserves, and I, for one, have to confess I'm skeptical. I think I have a good reason for my skepticism. Uh, the Federal Communications Commission was once a transparent, predictable agency presiding with a light touch over an explosion of mobile and Internet investment and innovation that has greatly benefited consumers. Today, that agency, in my opinion, has devolved into a place where statutory obligations are left to languish in favor of scoring points. The agency's capitulation of the President's demands comes at the end of a proceeding mired in what I say is procedural failures, and the White House's behind-the-scenes influence on the FCC's process has been well documented by credible news sources, including the Wall Street Journal, through emails from Senator Reid's office last May as well. It's the responsibility of an expert independent agency to issue detailed notice to the public when it intends to act and to apply its expertise to resolve the hard questions of law and policy. This process should be transparent and every effort should be made to resist calls to politicize the outcome. Perhaps in this respect, the FCC should learn a thing or two from the Federal Trade Commission, an agency the FCC recently rendered moot in protecting ISP consumers. A properly functioning commission doesn't work behind closed doors with the president to bypass the administrative process and properly functioning commission doesn't make decisions based on the number of click and bait emails that interest groups can generate. Properly functioning commission focuses on law and facts to generate thoughtful and legally sound analysis rather than being carried away by politically generated populist furor. The open Internet proceeding is not the only place where the FCC seems to have abandoned good process. I'm also concerned about the use of delegated authority. Commissioners have the responsibility for dealing with matters that are controversial or make new policy and should not simply delegate a decision to bury the result. I'm concerned that transparency has suffered between the commissioners. Lack of agreement should not mean that decisional documents are kept from other commissioners till the 11th hour. And I'm concerned that an excessive number of practical proceedings remain unresolved and thousands of businesses wait in the wings while the Commission focuses on extending its regulatory reach. But mostly I'm concerned with the FCC's overstepped its jurisdiction to regularly. Net neutrality, the obvious example here, but there are others. An agency only has the authority given to it by statute, and I can't see how any reading of the Communications Act would give the impression that Congress granted the FCC authority to be the ultimate arbiter of the use of personal information. I cannot see how the Telecommunications Act could be read to gut the Tenth Amendment, place the FCC in the position of deciding how states can spend their tax dollars. And I cannot see how the FCC could possibly interpret its governing statutes 
to wrest control of content from the creators and mandate its presentation on the Internet. But for the fact that I only have five minutes for my statement, we could keep going. A bidding credit waiver for grain management, government researchers in newsrooms, adopting trouble damages without notice, excessive and unfunded merger conditions, last-minute data dumps into the record. The FCC appears to believe it's authorized to take the potter Stewart approach to its authority. I know it when I see it. To be fair, some of the responsibility lies right here in Congress. We have not updated the Communications Act for decades, and technology has out evolved its regulatory framework. The FCC does not have the tools to do its job, but this doesn't mean the agency should distort or ignore the current law or, worse, threaten to manufacture authority out of whole cloth sh uh, should regulated industries have the temerity to resist the Commission's demands. Instead, it should work with Congress. We've offered a way forward on net neutrality that is more certain and less costly for society, and it's not clear to me that the objections to our legislation are based on policy. But if we could work together on fixing the net neutrality situation, I think we would be able to chalk up a victory for all of us and for all our consumers and for the American economy. So it starts today with trying to fix the agency itself. It's our job to do our due diligence and reauthorize this agency for the first time since 1995. I thank our commissioners and Chairman Wheeler for their attendance today, and I look forward to our productive session ahead. I would yield the remaining 30 seconds to the Vice Chair, Mr. Latta. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate you for yielding, holding today's hearing, and I thank the commissioners for being here. The, su the success and productivity of the communications and technology industry never ceases to amaze me. As it has been and is a constant bright spot in our economy as it rapidly advances and evolves to meet consumer demands. Given the FCC's integral role in the marketplace, it is critical that the agency is transparent, efficient, and accountable. That's why I'm concerned with the FCC's decision to reclassify broadband Internet service as a telecommunications service under Title II, despite the fact that the order goes against a light-touch regulatory approach that was fundamental for providing the industry with flexibility it needed to invest, innovate, and create jobs. The, order, the order's process was not transparent and represents a regulatory overreach that will have lasting negative consequences. Today's hearing is a step in the right direction in an effort to make the agency more efficient and effective by reviewing the Commission's policies, decisions, and processes. I look forward to the hearing from the Commissioners. Mr. Chairman, I yield back with a point of personal privilege from an Ohioan. I think your tie looks great. Sure glad I yielded time to you. <laughs> with that, I'll turn to my friend from California, part of the PAC-12, Ms. Eshoo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I don't have any sports analogies, so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, and obviously, I hold a uh, much different view. And so I want to express that view um, with an intensity that uh, I think needs to be brought to really uh, what this issue is all about. And I appreciate having the hearing. Um, uh, but I think that uh, uh, the main point is, is that on February 26th, uh, the American people finally won one, and it was big. The regular guys and gals across our country, part of the beleaguered middle class, were heard. It was a historic day when the FCC voted for a bright line, open internet rules to protect the ability of consumers, students, and entrepreneurs to learn and explore, create and market, all on equal footing. This is about net equality. The FCC decision ensures that the Internet remains open and accessible to everyone, a source of intellectual enrichment and an engine for economic growth and prosperity in our country. The Internet is the public library of our time, a laboratory in the most robust marketplace imaginable, and the FCC declared it open to all and for all. I think this is nothing short of extraordinary. It was a day when the average person witnessed something very rare. The big shots in Washington, D.C. sided with them. Decision makers actually took in and considered the advice of over four million Americans. I remember watching TV when Dr. King addressed a million people on the mall. It was a sea of humanity. 
We'll put a multiplier on that. It's over 4 million people that weighed in. And I think that kind of public engagement with our government should be celebrated and not rolled over and disrespected. Today, the majority has offered a legislative discussion draft intended to reauthorize the FCC. I've reviewed the draft uh, legislation and concluded that, in effect, it is meant to squeeze an agency that's already operating at the lowest number of full-time staff in 30 years. The FCC has to have the means to fulfill its mission to protect consumers, promote competition, and advance innovation. That's their mission. This includes huge, huge issues, and they are huge, like freeing up additional spectrum, promoting municipal broadband deployment, and enhancing 911 services. Any attempt to overhaul the FCC's funding structure should be fully analyzed and the implications of these changes should be fully understood. We shouldn't be horsing around with it in plain English. And a 48-hour review is simply insufficient. So I find myself wondering, why are we having this hearing today? I hope it isn't a fishing expedition. By compelling the FCC chairman and commissioners to testify five times over the course of eight days, it seems to me that the majority seems to have chosen to ignore a glaring fact. Four million, over four million Americans did something. They and countless more contacted their members of Congress to say, we don't want to pay more for less. We don't think any kind of discrimination, blocking, or throttling is good or fair. We're tired of poor service from providers, confusing bills, and having to wait for a half hour or more on hold to try and talk to a human being, and we don't want any gatekeepers. So I think that's really what this is all about. I welcome the debate, I welcome the discussion with the commissioners, and I yield the remainder of my time uh, to Congresswoman Matsui. Th thank you very much, Ranking Member. I'd also like to welcome the chairman and the commissioners here today. We know over the last year the debate over the future of the Internet has not been an easy one. There's been many twists and turns. But in the end, I'm specifically pleased that the FCC's net neutrality rules ensure that paid prioritization schemes or so-called Internet fast lanes never see the light of day in our economy. Americans will not experience Internet slow lanes or gatekeepers hindering traffic. We know, however, the fight to preserve net neutrality is not over. That said, it's time for us to really get back to working on issues that advance our Internet economy. I think Spectrum should be at the top of that list. The AWS3 auction demonstrated the massive appetite for Spectrum. I look forward to reintroducing bipartisan legislation with Congressman Guthrie that would create the first ever incentive auction for federal agencies. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady yields back. Chair recognizes the Vice Chairman of the full committee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And to the Commission, I want to say thank you for being here um, and, and offering your testimony. As you all know, we've got questions and uh, we want to move right on to them. I think that the recent actions taken by the FCC have really raised more questions uh, about your scope and your reach and your authority. And I will also say about transparency. Chairman Wheeler, I will tell you, I do not think it is acceptable for the Commission to pass a net neutrality rule before the American people have the opportunity to find out what is in it. And that was disappointing to us. Releasing a draft final order should have been a part of the rulemaking process. And it is disappointing that it was not. Every dollar you spend is a taxpayer dollar. Every action that you take affects the American taxpayer. So that lack of transparency is incredibly disappointing. Uh, I'm sure that also you're hearing from Netflix and some of the other stakeholders who have been very disappointed in what they found out once they started to read the 322 word filled pages. Um, I will tell you also as a former state senator 
from Tennessee and someone that worked on the telecommunications and interactive technology issues there. I was terribly disappointed to see the action of the commission to choose, to choose, to take a vote and choose to preempt state laws in Tennessee and North Carolina that restrict municipal broadband entry. Uh, these are decisions that should be made by their state legislators. Your actions there are disappointing, and we have questions about them. And, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Anyone else on the Republican side seeking time? If not, generally yields back. Chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Over the past uh, few days, we've, had, we've heard quite a bit about process, fairness, and transparency at the FCC. We just heard it again. Uh, from the previous, uh, from my previous colleague. But given what has transpired in this subcommittee over the last 48 hours, I wonder whether we first have to make sure our own house is in order. As witness testimony was already being submitted, the Republicans released with no notice a partisan discussion draft that would completely overhaul the FCC's funding. And this maneuvering is unfair to the witnesses and unfair to, to the members of the subcommittee, Mr. Chairman. Unfortunately, yes. Yes, so the draft, uh, discussion draft, was put out at least an hour and a half before any testimony came in. I realize that's still not enough time. But we circulate. This isn't a markup. This is a hearing. We followed all the committee rules. We have circulated drafts and always tried to be open and transparent. We'll continue to be. We're not marking up a bill. Well, Mr. Chairman, unfortunately, in this Congress, we seem to have halted a tradition. I'm not sure it's in the rules, but we've had a long tradition of sharing text with all members of the subcommittee at least a week prior to a legislative hearing. And we've seen well, these same partisan tactics. Will the gentleman yield on that point? Sure. Because actually when you all were in charge, I've got a list here of examples where that wasn't the case. I well, agree we should be more transparent. Well, let's just, let's just say, if I can take back my time, I, that I'd like to see us go back uh, to uh, a tradition, process, whatever it was, that we have at least a week prior to legislative hearing. I mean, the same thing happened in the Consumer Manufacturing and Trade Subcommittee uh, in the last couple of days. And it just, it, you know, I, I understand you can maybe give examples of things that were done in the past by us, but I just think that, you know, Mr. Upton, yourself, the subcommittee chairs have all said that they want to act in a bipartisan way. They want bipartisan bills, and I appreciate that. But, you know, if you're going to do that, then we need to have more time than just the, the 48 hours uh, that occurred here today. And we had the same thing yesterday in, one of, in the other subcommittee. If we're going to really move forward, we're trying to do bills in a bipartisan basis, we need to have more than the 48 hours. Um, in addition to that, um, I've yet to hear a convincing explanation uh, for why this legislation is a good idea. Given what we just went through, with the Department of Homeland Security, I doubt our constituents are clamoring for us to create another funding cliff, especially for an agency that just netted $41 billion for public safety and deficit reduction without raising a dime in taxes. I just think this agency is too important to, to play these types of games with its funding. Now, nonetheless, I'm grateful that we're having the hearing today. It gives us the opportunity to show our appreciation in person and in public to the S FCC for its work. Uh, so thank you, Chairman Wheeler, and to his fellow commissioners for, for all that you've accomplished. This, this has been an eventful year for the FCC. The Commission has certainly received more than its fair share of attention and also an unprecedented level of civic engagement. Four million Americans weighed in overwhelmingly calling for strong network neutrality rules. 140 members of Congress engaged in the process. And of course, the President expressed his opinion as well, which is not something that we should be embarrassed about, by the way. Yet despite the withering glare of the spotlight, the Commission stood tall. The commissioners and the entire staff of the FCC have shown a steadfast dedication to serving the public interest. You showed everyone who called in, who wrote in, who came in to support net neutrality that the FCC and the rest of Washington know how to listen. So thank you. Now, I have repeatedly said that I welcome the majority's change of heart and their offer to legislate on this issue of net neutrality, and I remain open to looking for truly bipartisan ways to enshrine the FCC's network neutrality protections into law. 
But after what has taken place over the past few days, I wonder if bipartisanship may only be the, in the eye of the beholder. If we're able to find a real partner in this process, we must make sure that our efforts do not come at the expense of all the other work the Commission does. The FCC must remain an effective cop on the beat to protect consumers. The FCC must continue to promote universal service to all Americans. The FCC must ensure that the telecommunications and media markets are competitive. And the FCC must maintain the vitality of our public safety communications. And that's why I look forward to hearing today how the FCC can continue to serve an important role in the broadband age. And so do the commissioners. Thank you for coming here today, and thank you for your public service. May I just ask, I know because I yielded time to you, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to yield a minute of my time to Mr. Lujan, but I don't have it now. But if, if I could ask unanimous consent. Because Without objection. Thank you. Thank you, Ranking Member Pallone, and let me second your comments about the need for us to work together. Telecommunications policy has a long history of being made on a bipartisan basis, and I would hate to see the polarization that defines so many of our policy debates dominate our efforts on this subcommittee. Before us are real challenges. We still have 77% of New Mexicans living in rural areas that lack access to fixed high-speed broadband. And as I've shared with Chairman Wheeler before, if we can have internet access at 30,000 feet on an airplane, we should be able to have internet access all across rural America, including New Mexico. Today I'm especially interested in hearing from Co uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel on the innovative potential of unlicensed spectrum. And I'm also excited to hear from a former public utility commissioner, a colleague of mine as well, Commissioner Clyburn's ideas to modernize the lifeline program on the broadband era. And I want to hear from all commissioners on how we can work with the FCC including strengthening the information technology systems that collapsed under the weight of millions of comments generated last year when a friend of ours, John Oliver, and four million others filed comment to the FCC, which crashed its servers. Four million comments is a lot, but surely the agency that is charged with overseeing the Internet should be able to handle the traffic. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank everyone for being here today, and I look forward to this important conversation today. Thank the gentleman for his comments. We'll go now to the chairman of the FCC for an opening statement. Mr. Wheeler, thank you for being here. We know you have a tough job, and uh, we look forward to your comments, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member uh, Eshoo. It's a privilege to be here with all of my colleagues. Um, there's been some reference up here about the open Internet. I'm sure we will uh, discuss it more today. Clearly, the decision that we made was a watershed. Um, you in your legislation, Mr. Chairman, and we in our regulation identify a challenge, a problem that needs to be solved. We take different approaches to be sure. Um, and no doubt we're going to be discussing those now and in the future. Um, but there's common agreement that the Internet is too important to ignore and too important to not have a set of yardsticks and rules. We've completed our work now. Open Internet rules will be in place. But let me move on to a, another couple of issues that I think are important to the committee. And um, one is that there is a national emergency in emergency services. And Congress holds the key to the solution. The vast majority of the calls to 911 Ms. Eshoo referenced the public safety challenges. The vast majority of calls to 911 come from mobile devices. In a unanimous decision of this entire commission, we have established rules for wireless carriers to provide location information as to where that call is coming from. The carriers are stepping up. But delivering that information is only the front end of the challenge. Mr. Shimkus, about 15 years ago, led legislation making 911 a national number. Amazing, it had never been that. Um, the calls now go through, but many times it's like a tree falling in the forest. And there was a recent tragic example in Georgia when a lady by the name of Chanel Anderson called as she was drowning in her car. And the signal was received by an antenna that happened to be an adjacent PSAP, public safety answering point, that did not have, that it decided not to have maps of the area next door. And I've listened to the call, and it's, 
It's heartbreaking. She keeps saying, well, here's where I am. Here's where I am. And the dispatcher keeps saying, I can't find it on the map. I can't find it. I don't know where you are. And they didn't know where to send somebody. There are 6,500 different PSAPs in this country. They're all staffed by incredibly dedicated individuals. But there needs to be some kind of set of standards. And only Congress can deal with it. We've dealt with the front end. But now it's necessary to do something about the back end. And, and this is not a power grab. I don't care how it gets done or what agency is responsible. But we really need, we owe this to the American people. The second quick issue that I'd like to raise is that I know, Mr. Chairman, that both you and I want a commission that works openly, fairly, and efficiently. And while three to two votes always get the attention, about 90% of our decisions during my tenure have been unanimous. Uh, about 2% have been four to one. Um, and there have been uh, 21 out of 253 votes that have been three to two. We also have, during my tenure, the best record of any full commission this century for getting decisions out quickly. 73% of our decisions are released in one business day or less. The last, the measure of that is the last Republican-led commission. It took a week before they could hit that number. We also have the lowest number and percentage of actions made on delegated authority. In, uh, of any commission, Republican or Democrat, in the last 15 years. But regardless of this, we should be constantly striving for improvement. Commissioner O'Reilly has raised some really good questions about longstanding processes. He and I uh, were in the same position. We walked in the door at the same time, and we uh, found processes in place that have been typical for both Republican and Democratic administrations. As I say, he raised some really good questions. And to address these questions, I am going to be asking each commissioner to appoint one staff person to work on a task force to be headed by Diane Cornell, who ran our process reform task force. And I'm asking Diane, I've already asked her, to begin a review of all similarly situated independent agencies so that we know what the procedures are for those agencies and that can be a baseline which, against which we can measure our procedures and move forward to address what I think are some of the legitimate issues that Commissioner O'Reilly has raised. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll now move to uh, the Honorable Mignon Clyburn, Commissioner of Federal Communications Commission. It's a delight to have you back here. Uh, former Chairwoman, uh, we're delighted to have you here. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chairman Walden, Ranking Member Eshoo, distinguished members of the committee, Thank you for the opportunity to share my perspectives with you this morning. In my, recent, in my written testimony for the record, I discussed the Commission's work in several policy areas. This morning, I will focus on spectrum auctions and inmate calling services reform. In March of 2014, we unanimously adopted the licensing and service rules to auction 65 megahertz of spectrum in the AWS three bands. This was not only important for wireless carriers seeking to meet skyrocketing consumer demand on their networks, but it was critical for the promotion of more competitive options. My colleagues and I agreed on a plan with smaller license blocks in geographic license areas. We also agreed on the need for interoperability between the AWS-1 and AWS-3 bands. Such rules encourage participation by smaller carriers promote competition in local markets, and ensure the auction allocates spectrum to the highest and best use. Most experts predicted intense bidding in this auction, but no one forecasted that the total gross amount of winning bids would be a record-setting $44.89 billion. The success of this auction was due in large part to a painstaking effort to pair the AWS-3 spectrum bands that involve the broadcast and wireless industries, federal agencies, and members of this committee, and for that I thank you. We should follow a similar collaborative approach in the voluntary incentive auction. 
robust participation by small and large wireless carriers in the forward auction will encourage broadcast television stations to take part in the reverse auction. A unanimously adopted notice of proposed rulemaking seeks to strike the proper balance between licensed and unlicensed services. We also initiated a proceeding to reform our competitive bidding rules in advance of the incentive auction. We propose comprehensive reforms so small businesses can compete more effectively in auctions and sought comment on how to deter unjust enrichment. An example of how the markets do not always work and a regulatory backstop is sometimes necessary is inmate calling services. While a petition requested relief from egregious inmate calling rates remain pending at the FCC for nearly a decade, rates and fees continue to increase. Calls made by deaf and hard of hearing inmates have topped $2.26 per minute. Add to that and an endless array of fees, $3.95 to initiate a call, a fee to set up an account, another fee to close an account, there is even a fee charged to users to get a refund from their own money. These fees are imposing devastating societal impacts that should concern us all. There are 2.7 million children with at least one parent incarcerated, and they are the ones most likely to do poorly in school and suffer severe economic and personal hardships, all exacerbated by an unreasonable rate regime. Studies consistently show that meaningful contact beyond prison walls can make a real difference in maintaining community ties, promoting rehabilitation, successful reintegration back into society, and reducing recidivism. Ultimately, the downstream costs of these inequalities are borne by us all. We have had caps on interstate inmate calling rates since February of last year, and despite dire predictions of losing phone service and lapses in security, we have witnessed nothing of the sort. What we have seen is increased call volumes ranging from 70% to as high as 300%, and letters expressing how this relief has impacted lives. I look forward to working with the chairman and my colleagues to finally bring this issue over the finish line, my sports reference, the best I'm going to do this morning, <laughs> by reforming all rates while taking into account robust security protections. Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member and others of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today, and I look forward to any questions you may have. I think you have a winner there. Okay, we're going to go now to uh, Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel. Uh, we're delighted to have you back before the subcommittee. Look forward to your comments as well, Commissioner. Thank you for being here. Good morning, Chairman Walden. Is I don't think that microphone stayed on. I've got it now? There you go. Okay. Good morning, Chairman Walden, Ranking Member Eshoo, and distinguished members of the committee. Today, communications technologies account for one-sixth of the economy, and they are changing at a breathtaking pace. How fast? Well, consider this. It took the telephone 75 years before it reached 50 million users. To reach the same number of users, it took television 13 years and the internet four years. More recently, to reach the same number of users, it took Angry Birds 35 days. So we know the future is coming at us faster than ever before. We also know the future involves the internet. And our internet economy is the envy of the world. It was built on a foundation of openness. That is why open internet policies matter, and that is why I support network neutrality. As you have undoubtedly heard, four million Americans wrote the FCC to make known their ideas, thoughts, and deeply held opinions about internet openness. They lit up our phone lines, clogged our email inboxes, and jammed our online comment system. That might be messy, but whatever our disagreements are on network neutrality, I hope we can agree that's democracy in action and something we can all support. Now, with an eye to the future, I want to talk about two other things today, the need for more Wi-Fi and the need to bridge the homework gap. 
First, Wi-Fi. Few of us go anywhere today without mobile devices in our palms, pockets, or purses. That's because every day, in countless ways, our lives are dependent on wireless connectivity. While the demand for our airwaves grows, the bulk of our policy conversations are about increasing the supply of licensed airwaves available for auction. This is good, but we also need to give unlicensed services and Wi-Fi its proper due. After all, Wi-Fi is how we get online, in public, and at home. Wi-Fi is also how our wireless carriers manage their networks. In fact, today, nearly one half of all wireless data connections are at some point offloaded onto unlicensed spectrum. Wi-Fi is also how we foster innovation. That's because the low barriers to entry for unlicensed airwaves make them perfect sandboxes for experimentation. And Wi-Fi is a boon to the economy. The economic impact of unlicensed activity has been estimated at more than $140 billion annually. By any measure, that's big. So we need to make unlicensed services like Wi-Fi a priority in our spectrum policy. And at the FCC, we are doing just that with our upcoming work on the 3.5 gigahertz band and in guard bands in the 600 megahertz band. But it's going to take more than this to keep up with demand. That's why I think the time is right to explore greater unlicensed use in the upper portion of the five gigahertz band. And I think going forward, we are going to have to be on guard to find more places for more Wi-Fi to flourish. Now second, I wanna talk about another issue that matters for the future, and that's the homework gap. Today, roughly seven in 10 teachers assign homework that requires broadband access. But FCC data suggests that as many as one in three households today lack access to broadband at any speed. Think about those numbers. Where they overlap is what I call the homework gap. And if you are a student in a household without broadband, just getting homework done is hard. Applying for a scholarship is challenging. And while some students may have access to a smartphone, let me submit to you that a phone is just not how you want to research and type a paper, apply for jobs, or further your education. This is a loss to our collective human capital and to all of us because it involves a shared economic future that we need to address. That's why the homework gap is the cruelest part of our new digital divide. But it's within our power to bridge it. More Wi-Fi can help as will our recent efforts to upgrade Wi-Fi connectivity in our libraries through the E-Rate program. But more work remains. I think the FCC needs to take a hard look at modernizing its program to support connectivity in low-income households, and especially those with school-aged children. And I think the sooner we act, the sooner we bridge this gap and give more students a fair shot at 21st century success. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, we appreciate your testimony. Uh, those bells that went off, or buzzer, as we so lovingly say, um, we've got two votes, uh, but we should have time to get through both the other commissioners' testimony, and then we'll probably break to go vote, and then we'll come back immediately after votes uh, to uh, resume questioning. So welcome, uh, Commissioner Pai. Thank you for being here. Please go ahead with your testimony. Chairman Walden, Ranking Member Eshu, members of the subcommittee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify here today. It has been an honor to work with the members of the subcommittee on a wide variety of issues, from making available more spectrum for mobile broadband to improving the nation's 911 system. I last testified in front of the subcommittee more than a year ago. And since that hearing on December 12th of 2013, things have changed dramatically at the FCC. I wish I could say that these changes on balance have been for the better. But unfortunately, that has not been the case. The foremost example, of course, is the FCC's decision last month to apply Title II to the Internet. The Internet is not broken. The FCC didn't need to fix it. But our party line vote overturned a 20-year bipartisan consensus in favor of a free and open Internet. With the Title II decision, the FCC voted to give itself the power to micromanage virtually every aspect of how the Internet works. The FCC's decision will hurt consumers by increasing their broadband bills, 
in reducing competition. And the Title II order was not the result of a transparent rulemaking process. The FCC has already lost in court, twice, and its latest order has glaring legal flaws that are guaranteed to get, mire the agency in litigation for a long time. Turning to the designated entity program, the FCC must take immediate action to end its abuse. What was once a well-intentioned program designed to help small businesses has become a playpen for corporate giants. The recent AWS 3 auction is a shocking case in point. DISH, which has annual revenues of $14 billion and a market cap of over $34 billion, holds an 85% equity stake in two companies that are now claiming $3.3 billion in taxpayer subsidies. That makes a mockery of the small business program. The $3.3 billion at stake is real money. It could be used to underwrite over 580,000 Pell Grants, fund school lunches for over 6 million school children, or incentivize the hiring of over 138,000 veterans for a decade. The abuse had an enormous impact on small and disadvantaged businesses from Nebraska to Vermont. It denied them spectrum licenses they would have used to provide consumers a competitive wireless alternative. The FCC should quickly adopt a further notice of proposed rulemaking so that we can close these loopholes in our rules before our next auction. Turning next to process, the FCC is at its best when it acts in a bipartisan, collaborative manner. During my service under Chairman Janikowski and Chairwoman Clyburn, 89% of votes on FCC meeting items where the agency votes on the most high-profile, significant matters affecting the country were unanimous. Since November 2013, however, only 50% of votes at FCC meetings have been unanimous. This level of discord is unprecedented. Indeed, there have been 40% more party-line votes at the FCC in the last 17 months than there were under the entire chairmanships of Chairman Martin, Copps, Janikowski, and Clyburn combined. I'm also concerned that the Commission's longstanding procedures and norms are being abused in order to freeze out commissioners. For example, it has been customary at the FCC for bureaus planning to issue significant orders on delegated authority to provide those items to commissioners 48 hours prior to their scheduled release. Back then, if a commissioner asked for the order to be brought up for a commission-level vote, that request from a single commissioner would be honored. Recently, however, the leadership has refused to let the commission vote on items where two commissioners have made such a request. Given this trend, as well as others, I commend the subcommittee for focusing on the issue of uh, FCC process reform, and I welcome the chairman's announcement this morning. Finally, I would like to conclude by discussing an issue where it should be easy to reach consensus. When you dial 911, you should be able to reach emergency personnel wherever you are. But unfortunately, many properties that use multi-line telephone systems require callers to press 9 or some other access code before dialing 911. And this problem has led to tragedy. Unfortunately, the phone systems at many federal buildings are not configured to allow direct 911 dialing. Recognizing this problem, Congress directed the General Service Administration to issue a report on the 911 capabilities of telephone systems in all federal buildings by November 18th of 2012. I recently wrote to GSA to inquire about the status of that report. And I was disturbed to learn through a press report just a couple of days ago that GSA never completed it. The FCC's headquarters is one such federal building where direct 911 dialing does not work. But as Ranking Member Eshu recently observed, when it comes to emergency calling, the FCC should be the example not only for the rest of the federal government, but for the entire country. I commend her and Congressman Shimkus for their leadership on this issue. Chairman Walden, Ranking Member Eshu, and members of the subcommittee, thank you once again for inviting me to testify. I look forward to your questions and to working with you and your staffs in the days to come. Thank you, Commissioner Pai. We now turn to uh, the fifth commissioner, or fourth commissioner and the chairman, uh, Commissioner O'Reilly. We're delighted to have you here. Please go ahead with your full testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Eshu, Ranking Member Pallone, and the members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to deliver testimony today. I've always held the Energy and Commerce Committee in the highest regard given my past involvement as a congressional staffer. 
with oversight hearings and responsibilities that you have to face every day. I applaud the subcommittee for focusing on this issue of reauthorizing the FCC and improving its process, and I rec recommit myself to, make, to being available of any resource I can in the future. In my time at the Commission, I've enjoyed the many intellectual and policy challenges presented by the innovative and ever-challenging communication sector. It is my goal to maintain friendships even when we disagree and seek out opportunities where we can work together. To provide a brief snapshot, I voted with the chairman on approximately 90% of all items. Unfortunately, this percentage drops significantly to approximately 62% for the higher profile open meeting items. One of the policies I have not been able to support is the insertion of the commission into every aspect of the internet. As you may have heard, the commission pursued an ends justify the means approach to subject broadband providers to a new Title II regime without a shred of evidence that is even necessary, solely to check the boxes on a partisan agenda. Even worse, the order punts authority to FCC staff to review current and future internet practices under vague standards such as just and reasonable, unreasonable interference or disadvantage, and reasonable network management. This is a recipe for uncertainty for our nation's broadband providers and ultimately edge providers. Nonetheless, I continue to suggest creative ideas to modernize the regulatory environment to reflect the current marketplace, often through my public blog. I've written extensively on the need to reform numerous outdated and inappropriate commission procedures. For instance, I've advocated that any document to be considered at an open meeting should be made publicly available on the commission's website at the same time it's circulated to the commissioners, typically three weeks in advance. This fix is not tied to net neutrality item, although it provides a great example why change is needed. Under the current process, I meet with numerous outside parties prior to an open meeting, but I'm precluded from telling them, for example, having read the document, that their concerns are misguided or already addressed. This could be a huge waste of time and effort for everyone involved and allows some favored parties an unfair advantage in the hunt for scarce and highly prized information nuggets. The stated objections to this approach presented under the cloak of procedural law are really grounded in resistance to change and concerns about resource management. In addition, the Commission has a questionable post-adoption process that deserves significant attention. While I generally refrain from commenting on legislation, I appreciate the ideas approved by this subcommittee and ultimately the full House last Congress, which would address a number of Commission practices that keep the public out of the critical end stages of the deliberative process. I believe that these proposed changes, as well as others, would improve the, commission, uh, the functionality of the Commission and improve consumer access to information. In addition, I would turn the subcommittee's attention to a host of other commission practices that I believe reserve, deserve attention. The 48-hour now, uh, notification that my friend uh, mentioned, testimony provided by outside witnesses at the commission open meetings, delegating vast authority to staff to make critical decisions or set policy, the Regulatory Flexibility Act and Paperwork Reduction Act compliance, and accounting for the Enforcement Bureau's assessed penalties. Separately, I've also been outspoken on many substantive issues, such as the need to free up spectrum resources for wireless broadband, both licensed and unlicensed. I look forward to working with my colleagues on this issue and so many more in the months ahead. I stand ready to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Commissioner. We appreciate your uh, input as well. Um, we will recess now so that members can go to the House floor and vote. Please return as promptly as possible as we will begin our questioning thereafter. We stand in, in recess. We have two quick votes. Exactly. We're going to ask our uh, public and uh, commissioners to please uh, resume their places. We'll get restarted here in the uh, hearing just a second when everybody gets settled. All right, thank you very much, and uh, we'll resume the uh, Subcommittee on Communications and Technology. We're now into uh, the questioning phase from uh, the members of the committee, and again, we want to thank all of you for your testimony today and uh, the work that you do with all of us uh, every day, so we, we do appreciate that. Um, you know, throughout the debate on uh, 
on the internet proceeding. I, I was amused there were some comparisons to what former Chairman Kevin Martin did or didn't do uh, with respect to his media ownership uh, proceeding. Yes, he wrote a late in the day op-ed, uh, put out a public notice, um, uh, testified before Congress, but he didn't do a further notice proposed rulemaking, and that seems to be precisely why the Third Circuit threw his newspaper broadcast cross ownership rule out. Uh, apparently, uh, I guess federal uh, appellate judges uh, don't think much of op-eds, news releases, or even congressional testimony uh, when it comes to satisfying APA notice and comment requirements. They actually think the agency should go through the procedural steps to make sure that uh, all interested parties, even those outside D.C. Uh, policy circles, get a real opportunity to understand a uh, significant shift in direction and, and have a reasonable amount of time to, to comment. So I, I've got just a couple of questions, and, and perhaps uh, I'll just direct them to uh, Commissioner Pai. How many of the Commission's tentative conclusions found in the NPRM were reversed in the final order? Uh, Mr. Chairman, virtually all of them. And how many of the Commission's, uh, uh, or well, what, what number paragraph in the NPRM says uh, that, that, they, that the Commission planned to assert its authority over IP addressing. Was that in the NPRM? It was not, sir. And what number paragraph in the NPRM put the public on notice that uh, the Commission intended to redefine the term public switched network? There's no such paragraph. That's what I was concerned about. Um, I didn't see that either. Uh, there, there are a number of issues that are pending at, at the Commission, and I know Chairman's had a, a lot on his plate. You all have. I get that. It's a rapidly changing environment. You have limited research, resources and all. Uh, you, some of you heard me talk about our little applications for FM translators when I was in the radio business, 10 years waiting, three, 30 days to satisfy the requirements and all. And, and we get a lot of input here from constituencies out across the country. And so I, just because of limited time, has, has the Commission acted on the AM modernization order yet? Uh, Mr. Chairman, it has not yet, and uh, the NPRM, as you know, was adopted about a year and a half ago. The record's complete and unanimous support from the public. There's another issue that, that came up. I was speaking at, at a group, and, uh, it, and it involves this um, uh, issue to allow small cable operators to operate as a buying group for the purchase of content. Has that been acted on yet? That's been pending for some time, I'm told. It has not. I voted on the NPRM about, uh, I want to say, three years ago. But uh, Three years ago? I recall it was the summer of 2012, uh, and it, yeah, I'm not sure what the status of it is, but I stand ready to vote whenever it's uh, teed up for a vote. And, and my understanding is the Commission uh, has not yet issued its quadrennial review of media ownership rules for 2010. I believe that's about five years ago. Is that correct? Uh, five years ago, but December of 2007 was the last time the actual rules uh, were adopted. So it's been eight years since? Correct. And isn't uh, that a statutory obligation? It is, and that's why I said we need to put the quad back in quadrennial. And what about the, uh, the work on the Connect America Fund? Um, has the commission finished its work on how Connect America will work in the mobile, uh, support mobile? My understanding is not yet, but it, that uh, work is underway. These are some of the things that trouble us, to say the least. Um, we, we also had an issue come to our attention uh, involving uh, the, the Western Amateur Radio Friendship Association interference case. And maybe, Chairman, I could uh, direct this, this to you. Um, I understand it's been going on for quite a while uh, and is quite disturbing. Uh, I've, I've been told about some of the audio recordings, allegedly the, uh, there's this jamming that's included a really awful, repulsive uh, uh, racial epithets and uh, threats against a, a female member. And, and it's come to our attention this has been sitting there for a while um, where, where these operators are, are jamming um, and, and using uh, really awful, awful language. Do you know the status of that? Can you give us some update on that? Anybody I on the commission? I can't give you an update on that, Mr. Chairman. I'll get If you could get right. back to us. Yeah, I think it's called the Western Amateur Radio Friendship Association interference case. Um, and and as a, I, I guess there are a couple of these that uh, uh, involving pirate radio operators, which, which leads into a discussion, and I'm going to run out of time here, about the closing of the Regional offices, you know, when we had um, the uh, CFO, I guess, be close, managing director here, uh, it, it, we weren't really brought up to speed or, or advance notice, at least, to this notion that you're going to close these regional offices. Isn't that where this enforcement activity generally takes place? 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, oh, sorry. Yeah, that's fine, or, whoever. Yeah. Commissioner Pai? Uh, yeah, the, yes, indeed. I think the, the field offices of the Enforcement Bureau perform one of the core functions, which is to protect the public interest by, among other things, resolving interference concerns, protecting public safety. And uh, while I, obviously I'm still studying the issue, I've had a chance to meet with our union representatives, and I know members of this committee, such as uh, Congresswoman Clark, have recently expressed concern about the field office's functions. Yeah. We want to make sure that however it's reorganized, we protect the public interest. And, and I'll, I'll quit here in a second, but we, we clearly don't have have, uh, uh, it, it would leave only two offices, one in L.A. and San Francisco, nothing for the West Coast, which I've, I'm hearing from various entities. And, and I, I was well, pleased. Can I can at least sure, add a course. little uh, on that? So, so there's multiple things going on. First of all, we need to be, make sure that in flat budgets or reduced budgets that we're spending our money efficiently. Um, when you have more trucks than you have agents, which is the reality that exists today, I'd sell got, some trucks. you got to ask yourself the question, are you <laughs> distributing resources as they ought to be distributed? When you've got one manager for every four people, you say to yourself, is this the right kind I, of structure? I fully agree, and, and, so and I understand. And so then how do you fix that? That's so, what I, 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 so what we'd like to have is the, the backup for this, because I understand that wasn't what was Happy proposed. To. And, and I think we have a request pending for that, and we're told, yes. but, well, I don't know whether we were told we can't get it or whatever, but we, we'd like to see the no, documentation. I think you've, uh, if my understanding is correct, you asked for the consultant's report. The, con the final consultant's report is not right, David? The, and yes. you, you will have it when I have it. I've, when, seen, is I've it? seen a draft of, of the structures, okay. but have also All sent right. it back for some more detailed information. All right. We'll have Thank that. you. You and I have far exceeded my time. I appreciate the indulgence of the committee. I recognize the gentlelady from California. It's okay because I'll ask you for the same. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, welcome again to the entire commission. Uh, it's obvious that, uh, uh, you know, that we have different takes on, uh, uh, on the issues, but I, I, I sincerely thank you for your public service. And uh, uh, to uh, Commissioner O'Reilly, um, this is a, um, a graduate of this committee. He, um, you were here under uh, Chairman Bliley, uh, whom I had uh, uh, the pleasure of, uh, of working with and getting a lot of things done uh, together. So uh, welcome back to Com Commissioner Pye. Thank you for your advocacy on, um, uh, on the 911 issues. You know that the, the, the mother and father, the mommy and daddy of this, are right here at the committee. Uh, Congressman Shimkins and myself founded that caucus and then uh, uh, helped. Uh, this is well, we did. What's so funny about that? <laughs> I think it's terrific. Uh, and it was when, pe when no one was paying attention to those issues, but it was before our country was attacked. Uh, Commissioner uh, 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 Rosenworcel, thank you for your, um, your clarity and your passion when you speak. And Commissioner Clyburn, go get them. Just go get them. And uh, to the distinguished chairman, distinguished chairman, I don't know how many people realize this about the chairman, but he is a man of history. And so I want to... Uh, pick on the vein of history, because I think it's very important for us. It, around here, a, a life is incremental. It's incremental anyway. God gives us life a day at a time, so those are increments. But um, I think what I'd like to do is to have you, and I want to say a few things about it first, um, to widen the lens of what is before us today uh, in terms of history. Um, now, the majority has defined or tries to define um, net neutrality uh, with uh, some very um, uh, scary things. Uh, and they call it railroad regulation, billions of dollars in taxes, new taxes are going to be levied, no investment is going to be made, the market is going to be chilled. Um, in terms of history, uh, we've been through the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, the Age of Invention, the Industrial Revolution, the Technology Age, and now the Information Age. And I think why this is difficult for some to actually see, and when you see something, you either 
get it or you miss it. We are at a moment in our nation's history where we're moving to a new age. And I would say that those that are on the other side of this issue are back in an older age where you have huge corporations, gatekeepers, duopolies. Um, that's not what the Internet is all about. So what I would like you to, as a historian, to address what this moment is and place it on the stage of history. Uh, thank you, Ms. Eshoo. I'm, I'm mindful. Of, if you've getting me started on history in this week. Well, we don't have very much time. Go I've, got a, I've, got, I've got a minute and 40 seconds I'll left. <laughs> yeah. I think that we're living through the fourth great network revolution in history. Mm -hmm. And if you look at those, what you'll find is that every single time it was the end of Western civilization as we know it that was being, people who didn't want to, to embrace the change were saying, oh, this is awful. I have hanging in my office a poster from 1839 that was put out by people who were against the interconnection of railroads. Mm. And it was all patterned around women and children are going to be hurt by this. It was paid for by all the people whose businesses would be affected because the railroads would interconnect. Mm. Yet that interconnection drove the 19th and 20th century. We always hear these imaginary horribles about the awful things that are going to result. Mm -hmm. And we also always end up saying as a society, you know, we need rules. We need to have a known set of rules. We need to have a referee on the field who can throw the flag. And that is the process that we have gone through since time immemorial. Mm -hmm. Um, every time there's a new network revolution. Mm. And we have the privilege of living through that and trying to deal with those realities today. Well, I think that that's magnificent in a short period of time. I wish I could question. I have questions for all of you. I'm going to submit them to you. And with that, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would like to ask unanimous consent that uh, uh, Congressman Cardenas' uh, questions be submitted for the record. He's a guest of our subcommittee today and uh, demonstrates his, uh, uh, his great interest in the issues at hand. And um, uh, another from um, many, many, um, I, I don't know, maybe 50 uh, racial justice and civil rights organizations uh, who have addressed a letter to the chairman and myself in support of net neutrality. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Yep. Uh, the lady yields back. The uh, next questioner will be the general lady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, Chairman Wheeler, I will just add uh, my viewpoint of when you look at our economic revolutions in society, whether it was the agriculture or the industrial, the technology, the information, successful revolutions are about freeing up, not restricting. And what we're looking at right now is the vantage point from, that you all are coming from is taking away and restricting, not freeing up. Chairman, uh, Mr. O'Reilly, Commissioner O'Reilly, let me come to you for a moment and talk taxes. You and I uh, penned an op-ed uh, back in July calling for the need for a cost-benefit analysis and uh, really looking at what had been said by uh, PPI, Free Press, uh, Professor Farber at, uh, you know, what they thought would happen with taxes. New York Times agreed with that. I want to hear from you a little bit. 30 seconds worth about uh, why we should have had a cost-benefit analysis and what you think the outlook is. So I believe that we should do better at the FCC on cost-benefit analysis, and this is a perfect case. I think the cost None was done. This is a, a woeful job that was done in this instance. Um, we're talking about hypothetical harms and real-world uh, impacts on businesses. Yeah. But in terms of your question on taxes, um, I would say that I would switch it more to taxes and fees because the question has been on universal fees and what happens in universal service going forward. The chairman has made very clear that, it, that the item in and of itself before us does not 
impose universal service. That is just something we're going to punt for about a month or two, and we're waiting for the joint board to okay. see this is something to go forward. We are going to see those fees uh, in, in the months ahead. Okay, Commissioner Pai, you gave an interview this week and stated that there was going to be a tax on broadband, and the commission is waiting for a joint board to decide April 7th how large that tax is going to be. You want to expand on that? Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. Uh, the order suggests that the Joint Board is going to make a recommendation on April 7th. Uh, the order also says that a short deadline, quote unquote, might be appropriate. So at some point very soon, the, the Joint Board is going to recommend uh, whether and how to increase these fees that are going okay. to be assessed on broadband for the first time. In addition, it's not just the USF fees, as uh, Commissioner Riley's pointed out. It's also state and local fees, for example, state and uh, property taxes. Uh, localities also impose taxes. D the District of Columbia imposes an 11 percent tax on gross receipts. These are all fees that are going to have to be paid by someone. It's going to be paid by the consumer at the end of okay. the day. Okay. Uh, Chairman Wheeler, rate regulation. <clears throat> I read something from Professor Lyons of Boston College, and he said Title II is fundamentally a regime for rate regulation. And then uh, we're looking at another thing which he said about a person which might include a large company can file a complaint with the FCC under Section 208 if they don't think their charges are just and reasonable. So you have denied that the FCC is going to get into rate regulation through this net neutrality order, but I understand that the order does not explicitly state that the FCC will be regulating rates on the date the rules are effective, but what about the first time that a complaint is filed with the FCC under Section 208 because the party feels that their rates are not just and reasonable? Uh, what's the remedy going to be? And isn't it true that the FCC will be engaged thereby in de facto rate regulation? So thank you, Congresswoman. Um, I hope somebody files that kind of a complaint. As you know, um, there hasn't been a complaint filed for 22 years in the wireless voice space, despite the fact that this authority, same kind of authority exists. If somebody apply, files that kind of a complaint, I don't want to prejudice a decision, but I will assure you that there will be a process that will look at that and that will develop, I would hope, a record that would make it very clear that the FCC is not in the consumer rate regulation business. Mr. Chairman, don't you think what you just said about there hasn't been a complaint filed in that space for 22 years proves the point that the Internet is not broken, this space is not broken, and it does not need your oversight and guidance? No, that's was I was referring to wireless voice, not to, not to broadband. And I, but I think the key thing is, you know, you cited your Okay, your let me cut college. you off there. I've got one uh, question for Commissioner Clyburn. And I want to go to the Lifeline and USAC program with you. You've advocated restructuring and rebooting that program, and you've had several supply-side reforms aimed at eliminating incentives for waste, fraud, and abuse. And the FCC's Inspector General, as you know, has performed a review of the verification process on this and recommended that the FCC may improve the effectiveness of the warnings that it gives subscribers and reduce the level of fraud in that program. We've had hearings on, on this, and I want to work with you on it. Thank you. And is it true that under the current system, the penalty for a subscriber defrauding the program by having multiple phones is to lose the subsidy for that for those phones, all but one. They get to keep one, and then the carrier is prosecuted. And I tell you why your answer is important. You all are talking about getting into broadband, and then in addition to the phones, and you got to reform all of this before I, you talk about expanding it. I totally agree. Uh, and one of the reasons why I set out five points for reform is because I recognize two things. One, we need to eliminate all incentives and all existing waste, fraud, and, uh, and, and uh, those abuses. We need to do that, and the key way to do that is to get those providers out of the certification business. They will no longer uh, green light uh, yeah. customers. We need to and prosecute think, the user, and, and not that, the And we have yeah, un under, uh, with, with guidance uh, uh, from my colleagues, and while I was acting chair, 
I yield back. My time has expired. Sorry. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Chair. The gentlelady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, the ranking member, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want the commissioners to know my district was, was ravished by Hurricane Sandy in 2012, and one of the most concerning impacts of the of the storm was a loss of communication services. A lot of people couldn't call their friends or family. Um, and 40% of our cell towers were knocked out in the state. Uh, a lot of people basically learned the hard way that when the power lines go down, communication services go down, um, go down along with electricity. So I wanted to ask Commissioner Rosenworcel, so I know that you toured New Jersey after Sandy, and I asked uh, what lessons did you learn about how to prevent these kinds of communication failures during future emergencies? Thank you for the question. I did tour the New Jersey shore with public safety officials following Hurricane Sandy, and I won't long forget what I saw, a lot of broken homes and businesses and cars and boulders strewn this way and that, and piles of sand many blocks from where the ocean is because wind and water had delivered it there. But I also saw a lot of people who were very committed to rebuilding, and I learned a lot about how communications succeeded and failed during that storm. What stuck with me was that many of the wireless towers in the affected areas went out. Now, throughout the 10 states that were impacted by the storm, about a quarter of the wireless cell towers went out of service. In New Jersey, as you mentioned, it was about 40 percent. But I would bet the number was significantly higher on the New Jersey shore. And in the aftermath of learning those things, we were able at the agency to start a rulemaking to ask, well, how can we fix this going forward? Because we know that 40 percent of all households in this country are wireless only. And in the middle of a storm, at the very least, they should be able to connect and get the help they need. So we issued a rulemaking in 2013. And among the issues discussed in that was the question of how much backup power is necessary at cell sites and how much of a reporting duty our wireless carriers should have when these sites go out of service. I hope that we can actually turn around and deliver a decision on that in short order because we don't know when the next storm is going to hit, but I'm pretty sure people are going to try to use communications when it does. Well, thank you. Let me ask Chairman Wheeler. Uh, I understand the FCC, as was mentioned, considering, is considering updates to its rules to ensure that consumers have access to essential communications during disasters. Can you commit to, to updating those rules this year? I, absolutely. We are, the issue that Commissioner Rosenworcel raised is a paramount issue. There's broader issues, too, and that is the whole issue of copper retirement, which got forced by, uh, by Sandy. And how do we make sure that when the power goes down and you are relying on fiber, which doesn't carry its own power, that you got the ability to make a 911 call? We have a rulemaking going on that that literally just closed last week. All of these issues interrelate, but, but first and foremost in our responsibility, which is why I focused on the 911 location issue in my statement, first and, one, first and foremost in our responsibility is public safety. I wanted to ask you about the designated entity rules, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, obviously, small businesses are so important in my state and elsewhere. And I just don't think small businesses can survive in, in capital-intensive industries like telecommunications without some, you know, smart public policy. I'm concerned that the current rules for small businesses still contain Bush-era loopholes that allow large corporations to game the system. And so I, I actually introduced today the Small Business Access to Spectrum Act to update the FCC's rules and give small businesses a fair shot at accessing the nation's airwaves. So I just, I'll, I'll start, I mean, I, no, there's not much time left, but I'll start with Chairman Wheeler if the others want to chime in. Uh, would you commit to working to maintain a robust designated entity program focused on genuine, genuine small businesses? You wrote us uh, and, uh, and asked us that, and I replied, yes, we will, and yes, we are. We have had a rulemaking going on. Um, and uh, we will issue shortly a public notice making sure that it is broadened out, the discussion is broadened out, and the record is built on the question of the recent AWS 3 auction and some of the very legitimate concerns that have been raised about that. 
The thing that is frustrating to me, Congressman, you say, yes, these were Bush-era rules. They haven't been reviewed since then, and it is time to, to review them. And what is really upsetting is the way in which slick lawyers come in and take advantage of rules that this committee – I was in the room, in this room, when this committee created designated entities. And, and as you say, the world changes dramatically in how a designated entity can be structured and can play in now what is a big market, whereas before it was a much smaller market. Our rules have not kept up, but the slick lawyers sure have figured out how to do it. And we want to make sure, whether it's in this or whether it's in slick lawyers playing around with broadcast licenses, that there is no way that we keep our rules current, and we are going to do that on this issue, and we are going to make sure the commitment that I will ironclad give you, <clears throat> sir, is that we want to make sure that we have a new set of DE rules in place before the spectrum auction that takes place early next year. Uh, thank you. Gentlemen, time has expired and yields back. The chair now recognizes himself for five minutes. Again, uh, thanks very much uh, to the commissioners for being here today. Uh, Commissioner Pai, in January, the FCC voted to update the broadband benchmark speeds to 25 megabits per second for downloads and 3 megabits per second for uploads. The speeds had previously been set at 4 megabits per second and 1 megabits per second. While I understand the need to update the broadband span speeds, I'm kind of curious as to the process the Commission chose uh, the speeds of 25 megabits and the 3 megabits. It seems to an outside observer that an arbitrary number was picked, especially considering that recently the Commission voted to spend $10.8 billion over the next six years through the Connect America Fund to deploy 10 megabits per second broadband. According to the Commission's new benchmark, 10 megabits per second would no longer even be considered broadband. Can you walk us through how the agency came to these new benchmarks? And then also, if you could follow up, and, and, and how does it still plan to spend over $10 billion on those 10 megabits per second deployment? in light of that new definition. Thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman. I think the problem is that the agency has viewed each of these issues in a vacuum. And so in December, when we were talking about rural broadband deployment, we agreed to spend, over the course of a decade, billions of dollars to establish what we considered to be broadband at the time, which was 10 megabits per second. Flash forward one month, all of a sudden we learned that actually isn't broadband. Broadband is 25 megabits per second, under which standard there's no such thing as mobile broadband, because the, even the fastest LG, 4G LTE connection can't get you to 25 megabits per second. Flash forward one month more, all of a sudden we learned that there is such a thing as mobile broadband, and it's going to be classified as a Title II service. And I think the schizophrenia that we've seen over the last several months from the Commission as to what is broadband illustrates the basic point. We need intellectual consistency that is grounded in the facts. And the facts in this case basically stem from the question, what do people use broadband for? And by and large, if you look at my statement in, on, with respect to the uh, January order, I was trying to look at uh, patterns of usage, and obviously there are going to be some folks who use the Internet uh, you know, for very high bandwidth applications, others who use it for less. The goal of the FCC shouldn't be to artificially pick a number so that it can declare that the broadband marketplace is uncompetitive and thus justify regulation. It should be to try to tailor, uh, with some forward thinking, what broadband means in the current era. And that's why I think the problem with the 25 megabit per second uh, standard, which I forecast would be jettisoned soon, I didn't know it would be one month from then, is that it was you know, simply based on, I think, uh, yeah, more press release, uh, or grabbing, grasping for press headlines as opposed to what actually was in the record. Can I try that? Let, me, let me follow up. Uh, I'm also concerned that this new threshold to reduce broadband investment in rural areas, you know, if you look at my district and you've seen it, uh, it, that they could ultimately deter the competitive entry into the broadband market. Do you foresee this, these benchmark speeds unfairly impacting consumers and businesses in the rural areas? That's a great question, Congressman. And coming from a rural area myself, that's something that I take very personally. Uh, the FCC heard from a great number of small, wireless, small providers, Internet service providers in rural areas, who told us that Title II, ironically, would take us in the opposite direction of getting more competition. A lot of folks in rural areas, if they have an option, it's going to be from one of these smaller providers. And so we heard, for instance, from 43 municipal broadband providers uh, who said that Title II regulation will undermine our business model that supports our network, 
raise our costs, and hinder our ability to further deploy broadband. We even heard from 24 small broadband providers on February 17th who said that Title II will badly strain our limited resources because we have no in-house attorneys and no budget line items for counsel. And those ISPs, by the way, include very small ISPs, including one called Main Street Broadband that serves four customers in Cannon Falls. Now, the notion that Main Street Broadband in Cannon Falls exerts some kind of anti-competitive monopoly vis-a-vis -vis edge providers like Netflix, Google, and Facebook is absurd. But I think that's part of the reason why the Obama administration's Small Business Administration was exactly on point when it urged the FCC last year to take a careful look at how these rules would affect small businesses. Because ultimately, that is where the digital divide is going to open up. It's for the rural Americans who have a tough enough time getting a broadband option as it is. Well, thank you. Mr. Uh, I'd like to ask a question uh, now. Uh, uh, the chairman uh, mentioned uh, in his opening statement about the task force on studying the agency process. And I'm just curious, uh, 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 Commissioner Clyburn, where did you find out about the task force? When did I find, when did I find out about the actual task force? Right. Uh, to the best of my law knowledge, last quarter of last year, it issued a report in February. There was a very interactive process. They asked each office to weigh in, and, um, and, and that is uh, when, subject to check, um, my memory's uh, sometimes a challenge, but um, last quarter of last year with a February. Uh, All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner uh, Worsen, Mr. W Rosenworcel, excuse me. Yeah, I believe they issued a port report uh, sometime last year, but I would have to go back and check. Uh, Commissioner Pai? If you're referring to the task force that the chairman announced this morning, is that the one? Right, the, the, he uh, asked about, that he spoke about in his opening uh, t testimony. But then I learned about it this morning when he announced it. Uh, Commissioner O'Reilly? Well, I appreciate the kind words from the chairman on the ideas that I put forward. I just learned about it this morning. Thank you. Uh, my time has expired, and the chair now recognizes um, Mr. Doyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to take a moment and recognize, uh, along with my, my colleague, Ms. Eshoo, the historic step forward the Commission has made in its open Internet order and the order on municipal broadband. You know, taken together, these actions by the Commission represent incredible wins for consumers, entrepreneurs, and millions of Americans who called on the Commission to take action. Innovators shouldn't need to ask permission or pay gatekeepers to deploy new products and services, and the FCC's actions will ensure that this remains true. And I want to point out one more thing, too. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle have been talking about Title II like it's the end of the world. Well, up until 2002, the Internet was treated as a Title II service. It was a Republican FCC chairman and a Republican commission that acted to reclassify the Internet as an information service. I see this rule as the FCC finally setting things straight. Chairman Wheeler, last September, you testified before the House Small Business Committee. You were asked about net neutrality proceedings, and you stated Title II is on the table. Now, my Republican colleagues are making the allegation that you only started looking at Title II as a result of White House interference in November of 2014. Was the FCC considering using its Title II authority before President Obama joined millions of Americans in calling on the FCC to take that course of action? Uh, yes, sir. In the Small Business uh, Committee that you, that you cite, there was one member who was saying to me, don't you dare do Title II, and I was saying we're seriously considering Title II, and there was one member who was saying we want you to do Title II, and I said, yes, we're <laughs> considering doing Title II. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me ask you another question. The open Internet order makes great strides to protect consumers and innovators, but in particular, by including interconnection and protections for consumer privacy through Section 222 in this order, I want to get your commitment that the Commission will move quickly to complete the rulemaking on Section 222 and ensure that the Commission has rules in place to protect consumer privacy online. And I'd also like your commitment that the Commission will take seriously this new responsibility on interconnection. With all of the recent announcements by over-the-top providers releasing new streaming video services, I think it's more important than ever that gatekeepers do not restrict these new services' accesses to, to uh, consumers. And also, Mr. Chairman, while I've got you here, I'd be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to mention special access. I understand that the data collection component is complete, 
I would encourage you to move forward as quickly as possible to complete analysis of that data and to take action to address any harms taking place. Fixing this situation is a great opportunity to improve competition and economic growth across this country. Um, so let me see if I can go through. One, two, three. Uh, one, on privacy. Absolutely, sir. Uh, and it starts next month when we're holding a workshop that gets the parties together and says, okay, let's talk specifically about how Section 222 exists in this new reality. Next month, and then we move after, after that. Um, secondly, with regard to interconnection. I could not agree more with your point about how over-the-top services are revolutionizing and are going to be the consumer's savior. I, I sit before this committee before and other committees, and it's a bipartisan belief that something has to be done about cable prices. And that starts with alternatives, and those alternatives are delivered over the top. And those alternatives are delivered via the Internet. And that is why the Internet has to be open so that there are competitive alternatives for people. And I got myself so Special well access. Special my, access. My hair, was, my hair was not gray when I first started asking the commission about special access. Special, special access. Actually, we are in the process. We've just gotten permission and have begun the data collection on special access. Special access is an incredibly important issue that is particularly essential to those who are bringing competition to communications. And my goal is that we're going to have this whole special access issue on the table and dealt with before the end of the year. Thank you. And one last thing. Uh, and I. I, I this, this question, it's on the AWS3 auction. It raised $45 billion in revenue, uh, meeting all the funding targets, including fully funding FirstNet and NextGen 9-11. You know, considering this new reality and the massive uh, appetite for spectrum by wireless carriers, haven't, hasn't the FCC been liberated uh, from these fully funded objections and its reconsideration of its previous decision on the size of the spectrum reserve and the incentive auction? Well, that's one of the issues that we're going to be addressing again as we put together the final rules uh, for uh, the auction. Uh, I understand your point that, um, that we have now lived up to our, our committed obligations, um, and, uh, and this is an issue that we'll be dealing with in the next couple of months. Commissioner Clyburn, Rosenworth, do you have comments on that, too, very briefly? I, one of the things that I, I, I joke about, and I, this is a positive joke, is that all predictions were wrong. Uh, right. th that right. two and a half, three times the amount of money that was predicted was raised. You, you were right to say that we um, have met our obligations and we will continue through um, other auctions, including to incentive auction, to deliver spectrum to the American people. Yes. Uh, I agree with the chairman. We'll be looking at this in the next few months. Uh, it's important we follow the statute, and it is also important that we make sure that everybody has some opportunities to bid in this upcoming auction and that no uh, community, a single player, walks away with all the spectrum. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your indulgence, and I'd just like to include in the record this letter from the Public Interest Spectrum Coalition in regards to the incentive auction. Uh, without objection. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The uh, gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome to the commissioners. It's great to have you here. Um, the uh, I want to be careful in in – because history does tell us a lot of things. Uh, I was fortunate to be on the committee during September 11th. Uh, Chairman Upton of the subcommittee at that time took us to ground zero because we had the Ver Verizon uh, switching station right across the street. And what I learned in, in walking through that process, it was really only a big company that could get Wall Street back online after that catastrophic uh, attack. And it's true. I mean, I still got pictures of it. Uh, the basement was flooded. You had uh, wires going up to the third floor. You had individuals hand tying the copper lines. Um, so as we talk about our great country and competition and, and, and large entities, sometimes large entities are, are, are very important in, in the security of, of this country. Um, the uh, and I want to also, thanks for the kind words on 911. It's really a team effort. I, Anna and I have had a fortune to work on this. But it's, 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 a, it's, it's a process that you've got to stay vigilant on, as Chairman Wheeler, you mentioned. Uh, first, we dealt with uh, 911 over cell. Mm -hmm. then, then really went to location. 
Then we went to voice over internet. Now we're back in the location um, because I'm being told by some PSAPs that there's really too many right now and that they maybe should centralize those. Any comments? Uh, briefly, if you can. So, you know, one of the interesting things that was in your bill that, that you and Ms. Eshoo had um, was you asked states to voluntarily have state-level coordination of their PSAPs. Um, and by and large, that has been observed in the breach. It, it hasn't existed. I mean, this, the situation I talked about in Georgia, there's no state-level coordination in, in Georgia. And, and this is introducing mobile means that that the people on the right side and the people on the left side of the map need to be able to be talking to each other, they need to have similar standards. Let me give you just one more. You, t you ticked off some of the issues in terms of the technologies. The other is text to 911, which we have required carriers to do, and which of the, of the 6,500 PSAPs in the country, 200 have implemented it. And, and that means that America's deaf and hard of hearing community which, thanks to the unanimous action of this committee, this commission, um, has text to 911 capabilities provided by carriers, they can text away and there's nobody who hears it. And I guess the other thing that we also didn't talk about was the, the testing that you did on the elevation, I would say the elevation. Yes, sir. The ability to get the high rise right and stuff like yes, that. Sir. And, and uh, I'm very excited about that, that opportunity. Of course, I don't have much high rise in, uh, yeah, in, in my congressional district, but uh, I know it's probably important in large metropolitan yeah. areas. Uh, give me some um, a comfort. Uh, my concern with um, the, the rule uh, being presented is one, litigation, um, two, I, I have this concern about how do you incentivize build out of the pipes um, when it looks like you're moving back to re-regulation yeah. and that if you are re-regulating then you then you have to have a, a fee that's where this fee debate comes from so how, how do you get a fee to help build out and maybe I'm a simpl simplistic view but um, and then the other question I have is really really about the megabit debate 10 25 how do you encourage in this new venue, and then I'll end, and you all, if you all can end, how do you, in the individual consumer to decide what speed they want versus being forced to buy a, a, a speed which they will never do use, like my, like my mother-in-law. Right. Consumer, so, it's, it's interesting, Congressman. Everybody cites their mother or their mother-in-law in that example. <laughs> uh, and uh, the there is nothing in here that regulates or establish tariffs for um, uh, consumer services, for, for the rates for consumer services. Um, the, there is nothing in here that says that a company can't have multiple levels of services. So your mother-in-law gets email only, you know, and the person next door. And will pay for that and simple we'll service that versus kind of whatever. And the person next door wants Just to Just so I can have email. a contrary debate, can I have Commissioner Pye or Commissioner O'Reilly address those before I run out of time, which I'm about ready to do? Well, a couple of different issues, uh, Congressman. One, I think the order explicitly opens the door to ex post rate regulation. Anyone can file a complaint under Section 208, either with the commission or with any federal court across the country, and that commission or court will have to adjudicate whether or not the rate is just or reasonable. And the fact that while on the surface you might allow for differential prices based on different services, nonetheless, it's ultimately up to the caprice of any given commission or court to decide after the fact whether the rate is just and reasonable. And that is the essence of rate regulation. Additionally, you pointed out the incentive or the effect that this would have on deployment. We've heard from companies that are that were responsible for the largest capital expenditures in our country when it comes to broadband and companies that represent very small uh, market areas. And they've told us that the impact of this kind of rate regulation and other Title II regulations is going to impede them from delivering some of those advanced services to anybody, whether it's high bandwidth user or your mother-in-law. With respect to my colleagues and everybody else, I'll just yield back now. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes five minutes. The gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Lobsack, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks to all of you for being here today. Uh, great uh, discussion about various issues. Uh, I guess I'll start out by, by saying I don't want to be too presumptuous about this, but I think a lot of us up here 
uh, have a lot of concerns about rural broadband in particular. I know that that's a big concern for all of you. Um, I have 24 counties, and although the committee chairman reminded me that uh, his district's a lot larger than mine, I don't mean the current chair, I mean uh, Chairman Walden, and uh, we've got someone from North Dakota, that's a lot bigger than my district too, but I have 24 counties and uh, have a lot of rural broadband carriers, a lot of, a lot of ISPs, small ISPs, as you mentioned, uh, Commissioner Pai, uh, but a lot of folks who need rural broadband for education, educational opportunities, for you know, health opportunities. We're going to see a lot more telehealth, I think, in rural areas going forward. We're going to need that. Um, for farmers who have to access GPS so they can, they can plant and do it efficiently and, and, and make a living. Uh, and for economic development, there's no question. And a lot of other reasons as well. I, I, I have one quick statistical question for you, uh, Commissioner Pai. You mentioned um, you gave us some numbers as far as I think it was municipal providers and small providers. Can you repeat those numbers? You had two numbers, I believe. Uh, sure. We received a letter from 43 municipal broadband providers on February 10th, and we also received a letter from 24 small broadband providers, each of which serves less than 1,000 customers on February 17th. Thank you for those numbers. How many small providers are there in the country? You received 20 from 24. How, do you know what the number is total? Oh, yeah, I'm not sure what the overall number is. We have a lot in Iowa alone. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the overall number is, but this is very representative. Of what About we 800, sir. About 800. Thank yes, you. We also heard thank from you very much. No, thank you, Mr. White. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Chairman Wheeler, as I'm sure you're, you're aware, the FCC reauthorization bill draft that we have before us on this committee uh, that's been offered by the majority would make the Universal Service Fund subject to the appropriations process. Uh, I've been here nine years, my ninth year, and uh, things are pretty dysfunctional here, as we all know, when it comes to the appropriations process. Uh, in this current environment where Congress really is, seems utterly incapable, if you will, of passing a bill through regular order, uh, we saw this with the last minute with the DHS. Tying US, USF funding, which is so important for rural areas, as you know, to the appropriations process, I think does risk a lot of instability down the road. I know you may not be willing to weigh in on this, but, but my question to you is do you support attaching USF, USF funding to the appropriations process? Well, let, me, let me see if I can answer that, Congressman, by talking about what we hear from the kind of carriers you were talking about, the small rural carriers. Um, and they say, we need certainty. You're asking us to deploy capital. And we need to know that the capital from you is going to come behind that. And we need to know five, seven years of certainty that this money is going to be there. And that's the way the Universal Service Program has been run, to provide that kind of certainty. Clearly a serious concern is that if all of a sudden that certainty is impacted because the appropriations move like this or, or don't move, mm -hmm. uh, and we're dealing with CRs or whatever the case may be, the ability of these rural carriers to make the investments that are necessary to provide service in high-cost areas will be significantly impaired. Not to mention putting a cap on such a fund as well which I think is something that is called for as well. Um, it's, it's, this is just a really huge concern for so many of us, uh, you know, the rural broadband issue, as I mentioned. And, and I've had concerns in the past about how the USF is administered as well. Uh, I want to make sure, and I'd be happy to hear from any of you here, I want to make sure that the USF fund actually goes to where it's supposed to go as well and that those folks who can access that and provide that kind of broadband that's necessary in those rural areas uh, can have access to those funds. Because we also know that a lot of those folks are the ones who are paying into it in the first place. And I've just heard complaints that, that sometimes the funding doesn't come back to them. They feel as though they're being disproportionately uh, put upon, if you will, in terms of contributing to that fund and then not getting back, you know, in a proportionate way, what they've been putting into it. Would any of you care to respond so, to that? So if I, can, if I can pick up on that, Congressman, the... Um particularly for the smaller rate of return carriers. Right. We are going to be putting into effect this year a revision of the Universal Service Program for them. Um, we're we're going to deal with the hated 
uh, quadrennial, or the, 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 the QRS, uh, the hated QRS regressive analysis, regression analysis. Um, we're going to come up with a model that says, here is what you can base your business decisions uh, on. Um, and um, we do need, if I can pause for a commercial, a self-interested commercial for a second, we do need those carriers to help us come together. Because the reason I knew there were 800 is because we hear multiple voices talking about what they need. And everybody sits in a slightly different position. And we've got to come together with a common. And if the industry could come together and say, here is a common approach, that would be very helpful. I also need to correct the record on something that Mr. Pai said, where he was talking about making a broad brush statement about, about small carriers. Um, the national uh, t the NTCA that represents these small carriers has said, so the track records of RLX, rural carriers, makes clear, Title II can provide a useful framework and does not need to be an impediment to investment in ongoing operation of broadband networks. And the small rural wireless carriers in a statement also said a similar thing that they will not object to this. And so we got to be careful that we don't haul out a handful of people and make great generalizations from it. The gentleman thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair, for indulging me. Going the uh, chair now recognizes for five minutes the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Lance, for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Pai, would you like to respond to, to that? Thank you, Congressman, for the opportunity. Yes. I would. Uh, I think first, uh it is significant to remember that, number one, a lot of those folks who submitted the comments about Title II were conceiving of Title II in terms of just the last mile connectivity between the ISP and the customer. They had no idea, because the FCC never published the proposal, that this would go all the way to the far reaches of the Internet, including air interconnection. That's not correct. Second, well, Mr. Chairman, please, if I could respond to the chair Congressman. Secondly, uh, among the municipal broadband providers who, I mean, these are folks who by definition represent the public interest in their communities. Indeed, one of the municipal broadband providers was visited by the president himself in the week leading up to our vote. They themselves said, please don't fall, to, fall prey to what they call the facile argument that Title II won't have an effect. Thirdly, I think it's important to remember that uh, with respect to uh, the effect that Title II will have on investment and opportunity, no one has said, none, none, none of these uh, services have been subjected to Title II previously. At the very most, you can make the argument that last mile connectivity was, but I think it's critical for us to remember that the regulation does have an effect. We've heard from members of the American Cable Association, from small ISPs, from municipal broadband providers. And we can all debate about the numbers. What's indisputable is that these providers have thrived with light touch regulation. And I think that's part of the reason why just yesterday we heard from a major broadband provider, quote, we have benefited from essentially government staying out of the Internet. And I'm worried that we're now on a path to starting to regulate an awful lot of things on the Internet. Who was I, that? That was Google's executive chairman, Eric Schmidt. Thank, in Washington. Uh, thank you. Um, Commissioner Pai, in your uh, dissenting statement, you state, I see no legal path for the FCC to prohibit paid prioritization or the development of a two-sided market, which appears to be the sine qua non objection by many to the chairman's proposal. As the NPRM frankly acknowledges, Section 706 of the Telecommunications Act could not be used for such a ban. And while the NPRM resists saying it outright, neither could Title II. After all, Title II only authorizes the FCC to prohibit unjust or unreasonable discrimination, and both the Commission and the courts have consistently interpreted that provision to allow carriers to charge different prices for different services. Could you elaborate on that? Uh, Thank you for the question, Congressman. It has been textbook law since the Title II and its antecedents were adopted. And this goes back to the 1880s when yes. they were regulating railroads, that differential services could be assessed at different prices by common carriers. Extending that toward the telecommunications age, it's long been the case, as I pointed out in my dissent, that you cannot ban paid prioritization. And in that regard, I completely agree with the chairman's statement on May 20th of last year that there is, quote, nothing in Title II that bans paid prioritization. G given that, um, how long do you think that this is likely to be litigated in the courts and – I ask that because businesses need certainty as to what the rules of the road will be long term. 
I think whether you support or oppose uh, the FCC's order, the unfortunate aspect everyone can agree on is that this will be litigated for a long time. And this goes first, I guess, to the district court here in the District of Columbia? Is it will depend on where a petition for review is filed. It could be filed in any of the regional courts of mm -hmm. appeals. And then if there are multiple appeals, it will have to be uh, chosen by a lottery. And, and is it your opinion that this will eventually reach the Supreme Court of the United States? I think it will. It presents a very substantial question on which uh, I could easily imagine the Supreme Court granting a writ of certiorari. Commissioner O'Reilly, your views as to uh, the length of the litigation? I agree wholeheartedly with my colleague on this. This is a three-plus year debate that we're mm -hmm. going to have in the court mm -hmm. system. Commissioner Rosen Warsaw, your, your views on that, please? I believe we will see litigation, yes. And uh, Commissioner Clyburn, and it's certainly an honor to serve with your father in Congress. Thank you. I appreciate that. I am 99.99% .99 sure <laughs> that there will be a legal uh, So that this is even purer than ivory soap. <laughs> Wait a minute. I'll go, I'll go better than my colleague. Okay, because uh, I, they, the big dogs have promised they're going to do I, it. I, I take it with their word. I, I, I do think that uh, we need certainty going forward, and I'm deeply concerned uh, of that, uh, regarding that. Uh, Commissioner Clyburn, in a speech you gave several years ago, you, you said, uh, without forbearance, there can be no reclassification, and I believe you went on to compare it as peanut butter and jelly, salt and pepper, Batman and, Batman and Robin. Um, <laughs> would you have supported reclassification under Title II without forbearance? Without, um, without forbearance? forbearance? Yes. Uh, one of the things that I think we did right Mm -hmm. uh, was recognize the current uh, dynamics of the day. Mm -hmm. This is not your father's or your mother's Title II. Mm -hmm. uh, we forbore from 27 provisions, over 700 uh, rules and regulations. So um, I, I am very comfortable in saying this is looking at a current construct, and, and I see you looking at me. Uh, my seconds are up. Thank, Thank you. you. I think you should have <laughs> compared it to Bogart and Bacall myself. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be the next interview. Th thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. Well, thank you very much. The gentleman yields it back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney, for five minutes. Well, I thank the chairman. Uh, I thank the commissioners uh, for your hard work on this. Uh, regarding the litigation issue, is there any decision you could make whatsoever on net neutrality that wouldn't involve significant litigation? I think you have just hit the nail on the head, okay. sir. Okay, just wanted to make sure about that. Um, you know, most uh, all, I believe, most of all, stake, most or all stakeholders believe that uh, it's important to meet the big three of net neutrality, uh, no throttling, no paid prioritization, and no blocking. Uh, but there's other stuff that might be controversial in your recent decision. Is there anything that you'd want to bring up that might, that might be of interest? Thank you, sir. Well, there's actually, there's, there's, only four regulations in here, no throttling, no blocking, no paid prioritization, and transparency. You've got to tell the consumers what you're doing, and so they have a fair choice. Um, the other thing that we do is to establish general conduct rule that says you will not harm consumers, you will not harm innovators, you will not harm the functioning of the Internet and the public interest. Now, it's really interesting because people come in and say, oh, I don't know what that means. Well, that is exactly the way the FTC operates and the way that the carriers have been saying, well, let's take things away from the FCC and give it to the FTC because we like this case-by-case -case analysis better than somebody coming in and having a rulemaking. So we're not having a rulemaking that says we know best, this is the way you're supposed to operate. What we are saying is that there needs to be a judgment capability that says, is there harm? And there needs to be the ability, if harm is found, to do something about it, but never to prejudge and always to be in a situation where you're weighing all of the interests. Okay. Uh, 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 Commissioner Rosen, uh, Worsel, um, does the FCC have the power to regulate broadband providers consumer privacy practices that are unregulated, that, that are uh, unrelated to their phone services? No. No. I mean, unrelated to their telecommunications. Right. No. No. Is that something that would be of value? Well, obviously, privacy is an important issue to all Americans, and privacy in the digital age is an evolving thing. Our statute which dates back to 1996, involves customer proprietary network information under Section 222. 
and that is where the bulk of our privacy authority comes from with respect to telecommunications services. Are there enough engineers at the FCC to, to help you uh, do your job? I think we have terrific engineers at the FCC, but in revamping the agency, I think we should make it a priority to have more. It's clear that wireless technologies are exploding. The demand for our equipment authorization process is also multiplying exponentially. And if we had more engineers, I believe we would be in a position to help facilitate more innovation getting to the market faster. Um, do engineers tend to stay out of the politics uh, of the commission, or, or are they, uh, like other human beings, want to get into it once in a while? Well, that's a kind of metaphysical question. I'm not sure I want to answer that one. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. You mentioned uh, that uh, the, there would be great, there should be greater use for the upper portion of the five gigaband, uh, gigahertz band. Could you expand that a little bit, please? Absolutely. We benefit immensely from Wi-Fi in this country. About 50% of us use it to go online regularly in public places, and 60% of us use Wi-Fi at home. The bulk of our Wi-Fi activity takes place on the 2.4 gigahertz band, but that place is getting mighty crowded. We also have spectrum in the 5 gigahertz band that we use for Wi-Fi. Many of us, for instance, our home Wi-Fi systems are based on it. But only a portion of the 5 gigahertz band is dedicated to unlicensed and Wi-Fi services. We've got some other uses in there, and I think we should start studying those other uses and find out if we can free up more spectrum in the 5 gigahertz band so more people have more access to unlicensed and Wi-Fi service. Well, what are the physical limitations of the 5 gigahertz band, uh, line of sight, or, or yep. what are the physical limitations? So the, the easy way to describe it is the higher you go, you get more capacity, but it doesn't travel as far. So 5 gigahertz is really good inside buildings, inside households, and as more of us use devices that are not tethered to a cord, having that functionality is really important. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas for five minutes. I thank the chair and welcome to all the commissioners. Folks back home noticed that Commissioner Pye and Commissioner Riley weren't at the rollout of the uh, new rules on February 26th this past year. They've got some questions they want answered and want to know what you guys would answer if you had been at that rollout. They know their claims about uh, these open-ended rules that they do not violate the Fifth Amendment by taking, quote, taking a broadband provider's property. The Commission states that the rules do not break the Fifth Amendment because they, quote, actually enhance the value of broadband networks, end quote, by protecting innovation. If these rules enhance the value of these networks as the FCC's majority claims, why? Do broadband providers, large and small, wired and wireless, oppose the rules? Any thoughts, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Pai? Uh, Congressman, thank you for the question. I think uh, part of the reason why established broadband providers oppose these rules is that they have invested literally uh, hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars, since the inception of the Internet in reliance on the bipartisan consensus started in the Clinton administration that the Internet would, quote, remain unfettered from federal and state regulation. Uh, that same con com combination of President Clinton and Congress agreed that access to the Internet would be an in in information service in Section 230 of the Act. In reliance on that determination, a lot of these providers went to the capital markets, spent a lot of money, took a lot of risk to build out what I consider to be the best Internet environment in the world. As Commissioner Rosenwurzel has said, our Internet is the envy of the world. And part of the reasons why they have a concern about regulatory takings is under the leading case of you know, Pension Benefit Corporation versus Conley, uh, there's a question about whether reliance expectations have been disturbed by the exertion of these Title II regulations. And that's something that a court is going to have to work out and take very seriously. So they think it's a taking, it sounds like. Mr. Riley, your thoughts, Commissioner O'Reilly? So I, I would suspect that there will be a, 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 an argument made and, and challenged on the Fifth Amendment, and the assumptions made by the commission are likely to be to put to test in court. Congressman? Uh, yes, sir. One more question for Commissioner Pai. Hold on a second if I have some time, yeah. but I've got some questions. My people back home want me to answer. Uh, Commissioner Pai, this is all about transparency, how the committee works behind the scenes. You write in your testimony that your edits 
in the E-rate pro uh, proceedings were rejected, rejected. And yet, miraculously, they came back with another commissioner introduced those same uh, edits. Is that true, false? Can you elaborate on what happened there? Uh, thank you for the question, Congressman. I put to my own proposal for E-rate on the table two years ago. When the FCC teed up its own proposal last year, I suggested, okay, I don't need to go with my proposal. Working within your framework, here are a number of suggestions that would get my vote. I was told, no, a lot of these are all red lines. We don't want your vote. One of the suggestions I had didn't, obviously didn't go to the core of the item. It said, I want to allow schools and libraries to be able to use E-rate funds for caching servers doesn't seem too ideologically troublesome to me, but that was rejected explicitly as what was a quote unquote a red line. Miraculously, when the order was ultimately adopted, when one of my colleagues on the other side suggested it, it was, it was agreed to. Same thing on the incentive auction. I made 12 different asks. I was told no to 11 and maybe on the 12th. One of the ones that was deemed a red line was extending the comment deadlines because we put some very complex proposals on the table. We wanted to understand what the public thought about it. I was told no, that was a red line that would risk delaying the incentive auction. Lo and behold, now the Bureau on Delegated Authority has extended those very comment deadlines twice. These are just some of the you know, pretty non-ideological proposals I've made that have been rejected. Is that standard practice? It has not been historically. I can tell you that based on my first year and a half at the commission, while I might have disagreed with uh, you know, some parts of an order that were ultimately adopted, nonetheless, uh, there was a spirit of collaboration and consensus that ultimately uh, gained buy-in from all the commissioners. And that, I think, ultimately really makes our product stand the test of time. It gains us legitimacy among the American public and gives us more insulation from litigation risk. And one final question is just about, um, there's some parts out there that have said, uh, this action has been essential because the Internet is so essential to our life, the American life, and that the current situation is outdated and it must be changed. This is a change. So that age of change be y'all or Congress, the elected officials for the American people, our voices, as opposed to, not offense, but five unelected commissioners. I'm going to go home today and take some heat, good and bad, about what's happened here. You guys will go home to your families and be okay. How about us being in control as opposed to y'all? Any thoughts? Uh, Congressman, that is precisely why when the D.C. Circuit rendered its decision last year, I said, without knowing how this would turn out, we should go to Congress for guidance. You wrote the Communications Act. You've updated it over the years. You are the elected officials who should decide how the Internet economy should proceed. On a matter this important, with laws that uh, essentially constrain our authority, we should turn to the experts, which is Congress. Constitution, yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes for five minutes the gentlelady from California. Chairman, I'd like to yield my time, and I, we're going to switch our time. Well, in that case, the gentlelady yields your time to the gentlelady from New York. Thank you. Five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I'd like to uh, yield a few seconds to my uh, ranking member, Ms. Eshoo. Uh, to uh, Commissioner Pai, uh, as you went through the litany of your ideas and um, you didn't get your way, welcome to the minority. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me uh, just ask a few questions. <laughs> ask a few questions of uh, our, our distinguished um, commissioners. Uh, and the first co uh, question is to Commissioner uh, Chairman Wheeler. Um, Chairman Wheeler, I, I'm concerned about multilingual broadcasting alerts and the FCC's urgency around this issue. Um, in addition to 911 upgrades, what is being done to ensure that the EAS reflects the growing ethnic and language diversity of our nation? Uh, thank you, Congressman. I'm glad you asked that question. Literally yesterday, I was meeting with our um, what's called uh, CISRIC, which is our, our public safety and security uh, uh, body that is a, 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 an advisory group, and talking with them about the importance of updating EAS and the recommendations that they have put out insofar as making sure that those updates are communicated to all the parties. Yes, we have an EAS system that hasn't been uh, updated since the Cold War. Uh, we have to fix it to, to represent uh, not only new technology, uh, but also increased diversity. And I hope that we'll make that a priority because, you know, with the uh, challenges that we're facing, 21st century challenges of climate change, of flooding, of, of uh, unfortunately terrorist attacks, 
it's, it's becoming uh, more and more of a pressing need, a, a current uh, day need. Uh, the next question I have to you has to do with the uh, Section 257 report. Um, Congress requires the FCC to report on market entry barriers every three years. But your latest report to Congress, uh, the 257 report, was due December 31st, uh, 2012, and is still forthcoming. Would you give us uh, an idea or share with us how the FCC will prioritize uh, this as a process reform to ensure more diversity and inclusion in the media and telecom industries? Thank you. Um, this has been uh, an item of, uh, of contention. Um, my, uh, my colleague, uh, Commissioner Clyburn, uh, when she was acting chair, was moving this uh, process uh, forward. Um, I think it is fair to say that it ran into uh, some difficulties inside um, the uh, commission, on the, amongst the commissioners. Um, she did an admirable and excellent job that I am attempting to pick up on and to um, move forward on because these kinds of issues are important to the, not only the future of how we build out telecommunications, but the future economic opportunities and structure in our country. Very well. I appreciate that. And two years ago, I sent a letter to then FCC Chairman uh, Julius uh, Janikowski asking that the issue of activated FM chips in cell phones be examined. I also understand that you, Chairman Wheeler, are interested in this issue. What progress has been made to ensure that my constituents have every tool at their disposal to receive life-saving information in the event of another terrorist attack, power grid outage, or weather emergency? So FM chips are, are a great idea, and they are in an increasing number of phones. They bring with them a couple of technological challenges. One is an antenna size. They need a bigger antenna to get the FM signal and that in, in a tiny device that becomes an issue. Uh, they also uh, can drain battery power. Um, but they're increasingly showing up and consumers have the ability to purchase them and some carriers specifically focus um, on them. I think the broader question is whether or not the commission should be forcing wireless carriers to activate these chips or whether they ought to be leaving that to consumer choice. Uh, I know that broadcasters around the country are, um, are running commercials mm -hmm. saying, write the FCC, write your congressperson, and make them do it. I think this is something that is being resolved in the marketplace um, and, uh, and that we ought to, uh, to monitor that and, uh, and watch what happens. I appreciate it. I have a few more questions. I'll submit them to the record, Mr. Chairman, but I thank you, and I thank all of you commissioners for your hard work and diligence. Well, thank you very much. The, Jenny, the gentlelady's time has expired. The gentleman from Illinois is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for serving your country and, and spending all afternoon with us. We appreciate it. Hopefully <laughs> not overly much longer. Uh, Commissioner Pai, I have to tell you, when you were asked by Mr. Olson about your suggestions to the commission were ignored and then other folks made the same suggestion and they were taken in. That was that was actually pretty mind-blowing to me, to be honest with you. And, you know, the joke was made earlier, and I chuckled, too, about how welcome to the minority. Uh, but I hope the commission doesn't become like Congress because I think the intention of the commission was not to be overtly partisan. That's Congress's job. We battle issues. We debate them. I mean, that's what happens. We look for compromise. Uh, I hope the commission doesn't follow our lead on that. Uh, Commissioner Pai, in your statement of dissent on the open Internet order, you spent some time talking about the procedure surrounding the notice of proposed rulemaking. Specifically, you talk about how much the order changed from its initial creation and stated that the standard is whether all interested parties should have, should have anticipated the final rule, not that they could have anticipated the final rule. Could you explain a bit further the problems you see with what was originally proposed by the commission as compared to what was uh, eventually adopted? Thank you for the question, uh, Congressman, and uh, for the kind words about some of the bipartisan efforts I've made at uh, the commission of reach consensus. I think the problem with respect to notice uh, 
is, is substantial. Uh, I think the FCC teed up in May of 2014 a very different proposal from the one it ultimately adopted. The May proposal, for example, was based on Section 706. It never mentioned such things as redefining the public switch network. Uh, it never mentioned uh, the extent of forbearance or even what specific sections would be foreborne from. It never mentioned a whole host of other things. And I think the problem is that uh, once the FCC teed up this plan in Feb on February 5th and voted on February 26th, uh, virtually every, a lot of the things in there, unfortunately, have not. Been, uh, there's no record sufficient to support them. Forbearance is the best example of that. There's no evidence in the record, certainly not on a geographic market basis, to support a finding uh, sufficient to to, uh, to grant forbearance on a lot of these things. And uh, that's part of the reason why the FCC completely recast its forbearance analysis, created this new analysis that junked a lot of the previous, uh, previous FCC presidents in order to find forbearance. And I think there are going to be substantial legal problems with this. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Wheeler, earlier you said that if asked to regulate rates, that the commission would make it clear that the commission will not regulate retail rates uh, on, on broadband. Would you agree that a prohibition on the commission regulating broadband rates is consistent with your views? So I have said repeatedly that we are not trying to uh, regulate rates um, and um, uh, that, again, if Congress wants to do something in that sure. regard, that's Congress's uh, authority. I would so like wait, wait, you're not interested in, but what about the next FCC commissioner? Do you believe mm -hmm. that under mm -hmm. Title II that they have the authority to regulate rates now? You, I mean, and I respect that you don't want to, but you've created something that will now be passed down through generations of FCC commissioners. Well, as I said in my, in my earlier response, um, I, if this comes before us while I'm there, I hope that without prejudging the issue, that we can build a record that will make it difficult for that to happen. But you could understand. But Congress and clearly has the authority to do something. You could understand. They would like to do. Something. You could understand our concern. You know, again, we respect when you say I have no intention of doing it. That's great. But you can understand the concern of Congress, where you implement a rule, and then in essence say I don't have any intention of regulating rates, but I'm not going to prevent. I, I mean, I, I, you know, the next, so, the next Mr. commission Singer, could do it. Yeah, one of the things that we did was we patterned this after Section 332 and the regulation of uh, mobile voice. And, um, and for 22 years, this exact same authority has rested at the commission for mobile voice service and never been used. So if legislation uh, that said notwithstanding any provision of law, the Federal Communication Commission may not regulate the rates charged for broadband internet access service. That would be consistent with that view. That is what we are trying to accomplish. Okay. Commissioner Pai, we've heard Chairman Wheeler assert that his decision to apply Title II to mobile broadband services will have no impact on investment because mobile voice service has been subject to Title II, and we've seen substantial investment in mobile voice under that regime. Do you agree? I do not, Congressman, for a couple of different reasons. First, it is critical to remember that the reason rate regulation for mobile voice didn't occur was because the FCC, from the inception, determined that competition was sufficient in the voice marketplace so that there wasn't any need for rate regulation. Here, by contrast, the FCC explicitly finds that the broadband market is not competitive, so it explicitly opens the door to the kind of rate regulation that was not contemplated for mobile voice. Secondly, with respect to mobile uh, investment, one of the reasons why we've seen such huge investments since 2007 was because of the inception of the smartphone and the huge increase in mobile data traffic that was generated as a result. Wireless carriers now, big and small, have to spend to keep up in terms of infra infrastructure and spectrum to deliver some of that mobile data traffic. Mobile data traffic has never been classified as a Title II service. That is where, what has driven uh, in mobile investment, not the Title II application to mobile voice. Thank you, and thank you all again for your service, and I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. We now turn uh, to the gentlelady from California, Ms. Matsui, for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you, Commissioners, for being here. Uh, I've got a question for uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel. One of the uh, keys to innovation is spectrum and more spectrum. And I believe we need a national spectrum plan, actually, a plan that considers both licensed and unlicensed spectrum. Now, you've done a lot in this space, I know. So can you share with us briefly some of your ideas to generate revenue from spectrum sharing and the ways to incentivize federal agencies to relocate. Thank you for this question. And you too, I know, along with Congressman Guthrie, have done a lot of work in this area. Let's see. The fuel for our wireless revolution is spectrum. 
And if we want to have a modern spectrum economy, we are going to need a more consistent spectrum pipeline. Today, as you probably know, when we need more airwaves for commercial mobile use, we knock on the door of federal authorities mm -hmm. and we beg, coax, and cajole, and over time, they'll give us some scraps. And then Congress will probably direct those federal authorities to clear out of that spectrum, relocate, and then you'll ask the FCC to auction off those airwaves. This process is slow, it's clunky, it's not reliable, and it is not the pipeline that a modern wireless economy needs. That's why I think it's really important that we develop a system of structured incentives for federal spectrum authorities so that when we try to secure more airwaves for commercial use, they see benefits in reallocation and not just loss. And that could obviously include anything from changes in their budgets to the benefits through the appropriations process, through the ability to actually secure what sequestration might have taken away. But in any event, I think that this type of pipeline would actually make our spectrum markets much more effective and work more fast. Well, thank you very much for those comments. Um, Chairman Wheeler, I have a question for you. Um, yes, I re remain very concerned about the Stingray surveillance of devices that are used by a number of local law enforcement agencies. Um, without which appear, there doesn't seem to be any federal oversight. And the public should actually have more access to the information about Stingray device, including what it's being used for, its surveillance capabilities, and who has access to the sensitive information that it collects. And despite some assurances to the contrary, it is unclear to me and many others how the Stingray device does not collect data on innocent Americans. And so, Mr. Chairman, in August, you announced the creation of a task force on the Stingray device and similar technology. I'd like to know the status of this task force and why haven't we seen anything come out of it and what – a series of questions – and what you're doing to address the real concern about the lack of oversight over this device. <coughs> Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, the, uh, the task force did look into um, the situation, and uh, what we found was as follows. Um, that our jurisdiction and our authority is to certify the electronics and the RF components of uh, such devices for uh, interference questions. Um, and that um, if the application was being made in conjunction with law enforcement, then we would approve it. This is for the technology. This is not for who buys it, right. sort of thing. But in general, that 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 we would approve it, um, and that from that point on, its usage uh, was a matter of law enforcement, not a matter of the technological question of whether or not the piece of hardware interfered with other RF devices. So. You're saying that's out of your jurisdiction and we have to go to other federal agencies, including law enforcement, because I'm concerned about the device being sold on the market or over the Internet um, to non-law enforcement organizations or the general public. So this is something we have to follow up with law enforcement, um, federal law enforcement? We would, we would on the broad issue, it's, it is follow up with. Um, I think that we would have enforcement jurisdiction um, on an, in, an unauthorized use of an RF device if, in fact, it were being sell, sold illegally. Okay, thank you. I just want to bring up another issue here. More consumers, particularly the millennials, are opting for online subscriptions to buy the TV channels and programming content they want, and we're really clearly seeing the market react. HBO and Apple, streaming agreement, CBS is offering monthly online subscriptions, and on and on. I really think this is the future, and no doubt it's a complex issue. However, cable video is going IP, and soon the consumer will be basically paying for bandwidth. And we should look for ways to empower the consumer to be able to pay for program, programming they want to watch. So I think this is something our subcommittee should explore moving forward in a bipartisan manner, and I just put that out there, and I 
uh, yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back the balance of time. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Bilirakis, for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. And I want to thank the commission for their patience today and, and also for their testimony. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman Wheeler, okay. there, there was an enforcement action in the Tampa Bay area, the area that I represent in Congress, last April involving Mr. Humphreys. It seems that he had a powerful jammer in his SUV, powerful enough to jam local law enforcement radios and calls to 911. He'd been uh, doing this for, the last, for, for over two years. Right. When a local cell phone company reported interference, the field agents in the Tampa office quickly tracked him down and ended the significant threat to the safety of the folks in the Tampa Bay area. It's my understanding you're planning to close this enforcement office uh, in my area as the former chairman of the Homeland Security Emergency Preparedness Response and Communication Subcommittee. I have a few questions. Uh, how many offices, if you are closing any, uh, do you plan to close, sir? Sixteen. Sixteen. Uh, will the job slots saved from the Tampa Bay area be moved to the Washington, D.C. area? Yes or no? No. Okay. Are you closing the field offices and laying off staff to support the Enforcement Bureau's new work under the net uh, neutrality order? No, we're doing it to increase productivity. That what we're finding is it costs two to three times um, what a centralized operation would cost, um, that we've got um, too many people doing too few things in a specific area, not meaning there's not an issue, there are issues there, but that we can get greater productivity if we follow the kind of model the FAA has been doing where you have strike forces. And so we would leave in place in Tampa, for instance, uh, necessary equipment and would bring people in out of the Miami office to, uh, to deal with the kind of situations that you're talking about and that that is a more uh, cost-efficient way of accomplishing the kind of goals you're talking about. Florida is a big state, sir. According to the budget request, uh, page 50, the agency will preserve the integrity of public safety communications infrastructure by taking action on 99% of complaints of interference to public safety communications within one day. Uh, will you commit to ensuring that this metric is met, uh, it has been met historically, uh, according to the performance report the, the Commission has issued over the years? Will you commit that this metric will be met? So we believe that we can do this without a diminution in quality, sir. Okay, will you provide the committee a quarterly report detailing the Enforcement Bureau's success in meeting that metric, uh, including a list of actions taken through the remainder of uh, your chairmanship, sir. Good idea. Okay, very good. What do you want me to tell the deputies? I know you talked about it, if you can elaborate a little bit more. What would you like me to tell the deputies and other first responders in the Tampa Bay area who may be endangered? This is a very important issue, as you know, public safety, by the delayed response inevitable and losing an Enforcement Bureau field office, which, again, uh, Florida is a big state, and I know other members probably have questions with regard to the, the offices that are being closed 16 uh, nationwide. So I think the reality that we face is that we have um, a uh, flat or diminishing budget. Um, we have um, unfunded mandates imposed by the Congress. Uh, and we have to say, how can we increase efficiency? Do I want to close these offices? I don't want to <laughs> listen to hear you, what you're saying. I don't want other folks who are representing areas that are uh, going to lose offices and, and hear their uh, complaints. But I've got a fixed amount of dollars uh, to work with. Right, and so, and so the question becomes, this. how do you become efficient and, um, and that's what we're trying to do. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner O'Reilly, how do we, the United States, have any credibility telling other countries like China or Iran not to control network management practices within their borders if we are taking large steps in that direction with the recent overreaching broadband reclassification? 
So I think there's an extreme trouble that we are setting our stage by, by, by passage of this item on net neutrality. I think it sends the wrong message internationally. It was, that, 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 batch, uh, that matches up with my conversations internationally when I went to both Spain recently and I was in South Korea um, for the ITU. They are interested in engaging uh, on uh, issues of uh, the broadband, they would like to get as much uh, involvement as they can. Uh, those regimes you speak of obviously have uh, a greater government control uh, on the practices of, of internet in their in their nations. So it is a, is a bifurcated message that we were able to send before the passage of this item that we shouldn't do it here and you shouldn't do it there. Now we're saying, well, we're willing to do some things on regulating broadband, but you shouldn't do them over there, or that it's okay, acceptable practice across the world, which I think is just this terrible message that Commissioner we're sending. Pye, you, what are your thoughts on this issue? Uh, Congressman, thanks for the question. I agree with my colleague, Commissioner O'Reilly, and I would associate myself with the, the State Department's views five years ago when uh, they represented, quote, we are concerned that in some countries net neutrality may be used as a justification for blocking access for purposes of preventing unwelcome political, social, or cultural information from being disseminated to their citizens. And I think this is a bipartisan issue on which the U.S. has historically stood together, and I hope, uh, notwithstanding the February 20th order, that would continue into the future. Congressman, thank you, sir. Gentleman's time. Congressman, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, can I just say for the sake of the, the record, could we, could we submit for the record sure. the full quote that was just excerpted by uh, uh, by Commissioner Pai. Absolutely. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Because yeah. it's it's really taken out of con out of context. It is not. Yeah. Uh, we now recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. From the great state of Ohio. Oh, stop! I'm working. Oh, wait. Um, <laughs> I, I, Chairman Wheeler, I want to tell you how how honored I am that you have chosen to join with our chairman in paying tribute. To, uh, <laughs> you to noticed, Ohio State you, you today. You picked up on, uh, on this, sir, the color. Uh, <laughs> Is this button the one I used to mute? Oh, all okay. <laughs> uh, uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel, uh, I, you, in your opening testimony, I want to associate myself with something you said. You said we rarely go anywhere these days without our mobile devices on us. I, uh, I couldn't agree with you more. I was in information technology for, uh, for over 30 years, long before... Uh, there was any such thing as uh, as the internet as we know it today, and I submit that the reason we have these things is because we've had an unregulated uh, by the federal government internet uh, and uh, uh, information services that have allowed uh, the innovators to, to to blossom. So I I uh, I, I agree with you, um, Chairman Wheeler. Um, we've requested this committee's requested a number of documents that have been denied. Um, under uh, uh, under the claim of uh, deliberative process privilege, uh, for the deliberative process privilege to apply, an agency must show that a communication was a, quote, direct part of the deliberative process and that it makes recommendations or expresses opinion on legal or policy matters. And in proceedings like the open Internet proceeding, Ex parte filings are required to disclose communications between the FCC and the executive branch or its staff if those discussions are, I quote, are of substantial significance and clearly intended to affect the ultimate decision. Now, I'm trying to figure out how these two different concepts apply here. In withholding certain communications between the White House and the FCC, you have asserted the deliberative process privilege. If those communications were relevant to the Commission's deliberation, several questions emerge. Weren't they subject to the Commission's ex parte rules? Are the concern or are the contents of those meetings uh, memorialized in any docket at the Commission? How could these conversations with the White House have been both a direct part of the, deli of the deliberative process but not have been of substantial significance in that proceeding. Those are, those are questions that are rolling around in my mind. Now, I'll get to a question for you. I know that you have indicated in your written testimony that you received no secret instructions from the White House. But, of course, secret instructions, that's not the standard for determining uh, when ex partes are available. In the 10 meetings that you had with the White House, here's my question. 
in the 10 meetings that you had with the White House in advance of the FCC's action on the open Internet, is it your opinion that only uh, – that that was the only meeting that addressed the merits of the Commission's open Internet proceeding occurred last November? Uh, yes, sir. Um, and um, – that, that Did meeting, you say yes? Yes. The, and, and, the, and the 10 meetings, just, just to be clear – um, were not meetings that were necessarily on uh, on open internet. We had trade issues, we had national security issues, we had cyber issues, we had auction issues. But in the ten meetings that great. came in advance of the FCC's action on the open internet, uh, you're saying that there was no uh, subst uh, information or discussions of substantial significance and clearly intended to affect the ultimate decision, which would require the disclosure of that information? So is it your there, opinion that? There are two parts here. One, you've No, that's a yes or a no answer. Mr. No, you've, Wait, no we'll just be, you've correctly identified what the, what the test So is it yes or no? I, I did not get instructions in those meetings. That no, was, I'm not talking that about that. I said, that do they qualify under ex parte or do they, and, how do they qualify for both? And, I'm asking you a question, Mr. And Wheeler. there is so, an exemption Mr. Wheeler, for both. I'm claiming my time. And how do they, how do they, how do they, qualify under both. If they, if they are discussions with the White House, my goodness, that's the highest office in our land. I find that the American taxpayer doesn't see that as significant and substantial. How can they not be significant and substantial, clearly intended to affect the ultimate decision, and yet you deny them under a deliberative process claim? Well, there's multiple parts to the U.S. how. One is um, there were not instructions given to me. I've been on the record on that and been clear. Second is that that's not the that's not the basis. That's the not second, the determination. I'm, I'm about to the determination issue also is that um, specifically uh, interactions with Congress and the White House are excluded from ex parte and have been since 1991 and. But I'm going beyond that and saying that is a non ex parte conversation if there was a conversation that was taking place in that kind of a construct. And two, that I'll even go Under what basis? I got no instructions. Under what basis? I mean, you can't just make that up. The law says what is required to be revealed and what is not to be revealed. And a deliberative process privilege applies when you can show a direct part of the deliberative process and that it makes recommendations or expresses opinion in legal or policy matters rather than substantial significance and clearly intended to affect the ultimate uh, uh, decision. I'm quoting the law. So, I, well, I'm, I'm disagreeing with you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I think it's irresponsible that you're withholding information that rightfully should be open, openly disclosed to this committee and to the American people. And, Mr. Chairman, I've Gentleman's time exhausted expired. my time. Chair now recognized the gentleman from New York, Mr. Collins, for a uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I get to my questions for uh, Commissioners O'Reilly and Pai, uh, one follow-up to Mr. Johnson's question, Chairman Wheeler. Uh, you, there were ten meetings, and, and we do understand there, there was, uh, on the ex parte side, uh, disclosure on one of those ten meetings. It's my understanding that on the other nine meetings there was – uh, nothing of significance discussed relative to the FCC, where under the rules of ex parte, they, you should have or would be required to otherwise disclose those. Is it true there was nothing disclosed on nine of the ten meetings? No, there, there's the, the, the test is. No, no, I'm not asking for the no, there's test. There's a, there, was there anything there disclosed? No sir, sir, I'm asking the, the questions. Okay. Was there anything disclosed on the other nine meetings? That's a yes or a no. I had no That's a yes instructions, or no. no. I had no instructions. Well, I, I guess I would just and be fuddled that in nine of the ten meetings in the White House, there was nothing of any consequence discussed relative to the FCC that would require disclosure. I'll take you at your word and just say I'm befuddled by that. Now, one thing that we were clear about today is the importance of certainty. And Mr. Wheeler, more than any, Chairman Wheeler, more than anyone, stressed the importance to the providers in the Internet space of certainty, certainty, certainty. And I can't agree more with my life in the private sector. Certainty drives investment and returns, and with certainty, you invest in innovation. And I would say it's pretty obvious today the way things have worked has been pretty good, the light touch. We have the number one service in the world. The investments have been billions, and as, as Chairman 
or as Commissioner Pai said, maybe trillions of dollars. We'd lead the world today. Now, here's my concern. We've also heard unanimous agreement by the commissioners. Litigation is coming and likely to take three years. It's guaranteed. Chairman Wheeler said, guaranteed there's litigation coming for three years. Well, if that's not the definition of uncertainty, I don't know what is. The, for the next three years, the, the folks looking to invest and innovate in this world have to live under the ultimate uncertainty of which court is going to rule how and when does it move and what do you do. So to me, there, there's a real issue here, a very genuine issue of inconsistency with the chairman stressing the importance of certainty and then saying, and one thing is certain, we're going to court, which guarantees uncertainty. So I guess, Commissioner Pye, I'd like to say again, to me, lack of certainty is a wet blanket on investment. Lack of certainty is a wet blanket on innovation. And my worry is, with less innovation and less investment, we will someday wake up and not be the leaders in the world relative to what we think and know is probably one of the most important aspects of where we're headed. Could, could you briefly comment on that and perhaps take a minute, and then I'd like Mr. O'Reilly to fill in the remaining time. Uh, thank you for the question, Congressman. I couldn't agree with you more that uncertainty is the bane, not only of the private sector, but ultimately the consumer who won't get the benefit of some of that private sector risk. I would give you just two instances of uncertainty that this order generates. First, with respect to the so-called Internet Conduct Standard, which lays out seven vaguely worded, non-exhaustive factors under which the FCC is going to determine what is allowed and what isn't allowed. And FCC, the FCC, after the vote, conceded, quote, we don't know where things go next, the FCC will sit there as a referee and be able to throw the flag. The Electronic F Frontier Foundation uh, targeted this particular rule and said the problem with a rule this vague is that neither ISPs nor Internet users can know in advance what kind of practices will run afoul of the rule. Second example, the Enforcement Bureau advisory opinion process. Uh, nobody knows exactly how it's going to work. Commissioners aren't going to have the ability to have input into that. And when you pair the Enforcement uh, Bureau advisory opinion process with this Internet conduct standard, essentially the entrepreneurial spirit of America is going to be funneled through this regulatory bottleneck, and nobody's going to know in advance until they get permission from Washington what is allowed and what isn't. I, I couldn't agree more that the only thing certain is uncertainty for the next three years. Uh, Commissioner O'Reilly? I couldn't agree with my colleague anymore. I think he's, he's hit it right on the head. I, I, I would say I was in um, St. Louis not but a, a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, and talked to wireless ISPs and talked about what, what, what could happen under this item and what would be for their business. And there's, these are the guys, the small guys. We talk about 800 other providers. But these are 800 wireless ISPs trying to serve in the most rural parts of America, and they're stringing together networks under unlicensed bands, and they're asking for more spectrum, and they're like, what does this mean for me? And I'm like, it means more paperwork, it means more compliance, it means you don't know what you can do for your business for a number of years. And they were just frustrated out, out and be belief. Well, I share your concerns, and I think America will too, and uh, we'll have to see where that heads. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my time's up, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman from New York and, and our witnesses. And I, I've heard some of the same things from small Internet providers in my district. They're feeling like they're going to be overwhelmed by this, and so I'm meeting with some of them as well. Um, I know Mr. Scalise is on his way here, the whip of the house, um, so we will try to accommodate uh, his questioning. Uh, he's Mr. Chairman, I'm going to have to Any? leave. I, I have to catch a flight, and I don't know if that has a, uh, an effect on if I leave, can you keep the hearing open? We can seek counsel on that, but obviously we should try to accommodate the third ranking member of the no, House. No, I know, but, I, but, but the, we started at 11 o'clock, so I mean, he I could, he's had some time to get here. I, I, I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm a patient person, but I, I'm, uh, I don't want to miss my flight, so. What time's your flight? I have to go out to Dulles. Um, so uh, while we. It doesn't leave we from the Rayburn Horseshoe, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> So while he comes in the door here, we are now going to uh, let him get settled. But as he is um, getting settled, first of all, if I could ask all of the witnesses um, to, uh, there will be some follow-up questions. Some of them you've all taken down. Because of, of uh, the nature of our work, uh, we'd like to, to uh, have prompt responses. Uh, to the questions. I know you've probably had questions from other committees as well. Um, get that, but the extent to which you can respond promptly, that would be helpful. Thank you, Anna. And, uh, and we would like your feedback on the draft legislation that we put out there. Um, all of your feedback would be most helpful. 
it's not a rush job. We're trying to get this right, uh, and we think it's very important. So with that, I would now uh, recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, uh, the whip of the United States House of Representatives, allowing him to catch his breath fully, Mr. Scalise. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I uh, test my 40 speed uh, getting here, but I appreciate the, uh, uh, the commissioners uh, being here, uh, coming to testify about uh, their uh, their commission, also about this uh, this net neutrality proposal uh, that I know I have strong concerns about. I know a lot of my other colleagues have expressed real strong concerns about as well. Um, you know, I guess when you get back to uh, the the basic question of what's worked so well with the internet and the technology community uh, as a whole, you know, somebody who graduated in computer science who's worked in the technology industry, I've always felt that the reason that the industry has been so successful is because the federal government hadn't figured out a way to regulate it to slow it down. And, uh, and then yet here you come with a, an answer to a problem that doesn't exist, uh, uh, a heavy-handed uh, role of government. And the FCC's traditional role has not been to have a heavy hand. Uh, in, in this, when you look at the, the proposal that's come out, my goodness, I mean, over 300 pages of regulations, and it's just the first round before the proposal has even been put into effect. I, I guess, you know, if anybody's looking for a free and open Internet, I'm sure they look to the over 300 pages of regulations from the federal government uh, to start that process. Uh, it's not broken. Why is the federal government here to fix something that's been working incredibly well, uh, especially when you look at the role of federal regulations over the years and, and just what they've done to harm our economy? Uh, I do want to ask you, Commissioner Pye, because you made some comments earlier about the potential taxes and fees that can come with this Title II classification. And, and when you look at Section 202 of the law, it, it clearly gives that ability uh, to, uh, to get involved, for the FCC to get involved in regulating costs uh, for the Internet. And so if you could share with me uh, just what kind of impact this can have on both fees being implemented, uh, higher prices that consumers will ultimately pay uh, from this new classification. Thank you for the question, Congressman. I think a multitude of fees and taxes are going to be levied on broadband in a way that is ultimately going to redound to the consumer's detriment. Just to give you one example, now that broadband has been reclassified as a telecommunications service, it, that order explicitly opens the door to billions of taxes and fees being assessed through the Universal Service Fund. So now, in addition to that line item you see on your phone bill, which only applies to your voice, the Universal Service Fee, you're going to be paying a fee on broadband, and that will happen, I would imagine, in the next several weeks or months. Secondly, and critically, there are all sorts of other fees that are going to be assessed. For example, currently a lot of broadband providers that had not been classified as telecom providers paid a lower rate for the equipment that they attached to utility poles, known as pole attachments. They paid a rate under the Section 224D. Now, because they're all telecom providers, they'll have to pay a much higher rate at Section 224E. And smaller providers in particular will have to pay $150 to $200 million a year just for those higher pole attachment rates. Then you add on top of that the higher state and pro local property taxes that a lot of these companies will have to pay because they're now telecom providers. All of these costs have to come out of somewhere, and it's going to be the consumer's wallet. And that is one of the reasons why I'm concerned. Yeah, and we've seen this time and time again, that these kind of regulations and ultimately these new fees and taxes that would be paid uh, are ultimately be paid by, by consumers, by people that uh, have been enjoying the benefits of, of the investments that have been made by private companies. This isn't the federal government investing. This is private investment to the tune of billions of dollars. I, I, I'll read you this, uh, this quote, and maybe I'll let you add. Answer it, quote, there's nothing worse for investment, innovation, job creation, all things that flow from investment, than businesses not knowing what the rules are. You want to comment on that? I think that is, uh, as I've pointed out many times, the, the bane of uh, not just the private sector, but the consumer, to not know what is going to be allowed and what isn't. And it's in exactly in that environment where the private sector is the least likely to take the risk, to raise the capital, to build the infrastructure that is going to connect Americans with digital opportunities. And I, I believe, as you pointed out eloquently in your statement, that part of the reason why we enjoy the best Internet experience in the world is because we've had this historic bipartisan commitment dating back to the Clinton administration that the Internet would be free from state and federal regulation. That quote, by the way, was uh, Chairman Wheeler at his confirmation hearing. Uh, I do want to ask uh, you, Commissioner Riley, because you've commented uh, on this order uh, that uh, it will negatively impact edge providers. Of course, many of the edge providers have been proponents uh, of these, uh, these net neutrality regulations, uh, but, but you've 
raised some concerns about how even they would be negatively impacted, people that, that even asked for this. So if you can comment on that. Yes, a number of people have, have highlighted on this, this fact is that the lines between an edge provider and a telecommunications provider under our new definition are blurring over over time and so you may be today you may be an edge provider tomorrow you may be something else you may have multiple parts of your business and that is going to you know that is problematic as you try to figure out how best to comply with our rules more importantly I believe that the Commission is going to continue to push its um, regulations up the chain and so today is about telecommunications providers and when we talked about that under our new definition and then we're going to you know we now are having a debate in terms of and we're gonna have some kind of structured to deal with interconnection or the middle mile what used to be known as peering in my my conversation we're, we're, we're bleeding right into the backbone of the internet and I think that only leads us to um, edge providers over the time I see I'm out of time but I appreciate your uh, your answers and uh, hopefully this doesn't go forward but with that I yield back the balance of my time gentleman yields back and now that I know the rules only require two members of either party to be here we could go five or six more rounds let's go let's go I'm sure they would love to stay around longer and uh, <laughs> Do we order in? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I want to thank our witnesses. I know you have a tough job, and we may disagree, but uh, we're all trying to do the right thing for the country. So thanks for testifying. Again, if you can promptly respond to our, uh, our questions, that would be appreciated. And uh, we look forward to your return visit in the not-too-distant future, we hope. So with that, the uh, committee stands adjourned.